I'd like to call to order the August 19th, 2019 meeting of the Highland Park Board of Education. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend meeting, the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the Highland Park Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting setting forth the time, date, and location to be submitted for publication to the Home News Tribune and Star Ledger and posted on the board's website at least 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Members of the public who wish to address the board will be given the opportunity to do so before the board adjourns for the evening. Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Here. Oh, it's loud. <laughs> Ms. Simarusti? Here. Ms. Coleman? Ms. Gowan? Mr. Krieger? Here. Mr. Magaziner? Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Here. Mr. Roslovich? Mr. Woodward? Here. Be it resolved, pursuant to the Sunshine Act NJSA 10-4-12 and 13, the Highland Park Board of Education will now meet in closed session to discuss litigation matters and those related to HIV. These exemptions are permitted to be discussed in closed session in accordance with NJSA 10-4-13. Information regarding the Board's closed session discussion will be disclosed to the public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Can I get a motion to re re recess to executive session? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, can I get a motion to reconvene to public session? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, now we're gonna stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. It's over here to my right, your left, next to the podium. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we don't have any communications on our agenda this evening. Um, and number eight on the agenda is the corrections to the minutes, which is as stated on our agenda. Uh, corrections to the um, to the minutes from the May 13th. Wait, no. Oh yeah, the minutes of the May 13th meeting. Is that right, Linda? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we had a couple of little changes there. Um, and then item nine is the approval of the minutes from the May 13th, 2019 uh, meeting, and the June 10th, 2019 meeting, and the July 15th, 2019 meeting. All right, um, so can I get a motion to um, approve items eight and nine? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion of those items? No? All right, seeing none, Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden T. Nicola? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. All right, so that brings us uh, quickly to the superintendent's report and our much more interesting items on our agenda. Absolutely, especially the first part of the report, which is my uh, opportunity to call out some of the uh, folks who have been volunteering for us over the years. Um, I appreciate uh, our board president's idea, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, to, to do more to recognize some of those folks who've been giving up their free time. So I'm going to step up to the podium with my wireless mic. Uh, I've got some certificates and I'd love to get a photo with you and, and everyone else after I say a few words about those who've, who've come before us. Um, I've got my notes. I happen to know everyone who's being recognized tonight, but I also asked the principals and the supervisors to say a few words about, um, about some of the individuals who uh, I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, so uh, first things first, I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, Tara Canavera. Tara is a, um, in fact, Tara, you want to just come on up to the, uh, to the podium? Uh, Tara is a, uh, uh, Longtime resident and uh, member of the um, both the special ed community and uh, and the PTO community, so uh, she wears many hats. Um, I got to know Tara, I think, first when you were working with Susie Boudine to begin the CPAC special ed advisory group, <clears throat> parent advisory group. But I also know that you've been very active working with Mr. Benjamin when he was here as principal with the PTO. Um, one thing I have to share, uh, while I have had a chance to get to know some of those volunteers who've worked with us, um, there's 
a few like you, Tara, who I've gotten to know very well, if only because you're extremely visible, happen to be very visible in the same school in which my office is based, so, so we, we do run into each other quite a bit. Um, but one thing I have come to learn about Tara is that she is not only a forceful advocate for particularly the special needs children in our school district, um, but also somebody who finds a way to very diplomatically be an advocate and be supportive. Um, you have a very good way, I don't know if anybody's ever shared this with you, but you have a very good way of being confrontational without being confrontational. And um, it just makes everything more pleasant, even though you do get things done at the same time. So with that, I'd like to uh, share this certificate with you and ask you to stay while um, I honor some other folks so that we can take a photo. So just don't go anywhere. Stay right there. Um, speaking of Bartle, uh, I would like to um, uh, call out um, Actually, two people, but one in particular who has put a lot of time and energy into the Bartle PTO. Our parent-teachers um, organizations uh, have struggled, to be very frank, with the board and the community over the years. Um, for whatever reason, I, I think we're seeing a, probably seeing a national trend away from um, certain parent volunteer organizations, perhaps because uh, people are being pulled in different directions uh, by their communities. Um, but there's always a couple of folks like Erica uh, Aringer and, um, and Ben, um, her sidekick, who um, have come out and been the core, like the rock, the state stability that people work around um, and are go-to people, and they're always behind the scenes, too. Uh, Erica, um, why don't you come on up, and Ben, if, I, I don't know how much involvement you've actually had as <laughs> her support, but you're welcome to join us as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Erica has been that person. Uh, the, the PTO of Bartle puts on various activities like uh, the famous Bartle Boardwalk, which my own children were a part of, um, the Ice Cream Social, um, things that um, are uh, happening behind the scenes to raise funds, particularly for a project I know that's still budding that you'll likely be involved in, and that's the redevelopment of the playground area behind the school itself by the faculty parking lot. Those of you who know that area know it's a mess. It's a mess right now, especially in, when the mudslides come. Um, so the money that uh, Erica and others she has organized, has, we've been raising, will go towards that uh, with some other grant funds that I'm finding under rocks. So um, please hold on to that and don't go anywhere because I do want to take a photo as well with you. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, switch up to the high school. Um, there, we have an individual who is not here. She's in Israel right now. I would like to ask her husband to come up to the podium. Um, Dr. Ravit Duncan is a professor at Rutgers University uh, in the science department. Um, Ravit is in Israel, but uh, I really do appreciate you coming out and helping her. So I'm going to give you that certificate to hold on to. Um, the board might not be aware that uh, Ravit has um, been offering her services, mostly gratis, to um, facilitate workshops for our high school science team, part of Dr. Nikosia's focus on transforming uh, our delivery of instruction. So it's more um, project-based, learning-oriented, more student-centered, more constructivist-oriented. Um, so we're trying to shift away from direct instruction somewhat and emphasize more of that uh, student creation of ideas, the inquiry that leads to, um, to um, curiosity. Uh, and Ravit's been really instrumental in doing that because her expertise is instruction in particular in the, in the area of science. Um, so I, I do thank you for being here. And uh, Ravit, if she's watching live stream, although it's probably <laughs> middle of the night right now in Israel. Um, hi, Ravit. <laughs> Why don't you step aside? You don't want to mind. Um, and last but not least, um, I'd like to ask Kazumi Pesca to, to come up. Um, I, I've known the Pesca family for a while now. But um, I had Mr. Lassiter write me a couple of words I'd like to share on his behalf um, about your work. Um, what I wasn't, uh, what I didn't know, um, because you're very, I guess, discreet about your volunteer work, um, which is, I think, a reflection of your humility, is that you actually helped to start and advise what we now call our Japanese club for the teen center um, and help the kids write uh, haikus, am I correct? that received national recognition 
which I greatly appreciate. Um, also, I, I have to say that the, uh, the Pesca family, I'll, I'll speak for your husband in absentia, <laughs> um, have been um, advocates for the student athletes in our, uh, uh, in our school district, and from time to time has um, worked with me to consult for the gifted and talented program as well. So I want you to hold on to that. And if I could, if I could ask the board president to come to the podium, I'd love to have a photo taken. Would you all just step on up? Maybe we could gather around the podium and, and, and take a, a picture. We don't have students to take it. We don't have well, have I, I've been eyeing Chris because um, because he's there, um, and I'm guessing because you're a, a scientist of your own, you would know how to use a camera. It's a really sophisticated piece of equipment. So if you don't mind getting up front, we'll all just crowd around. Why don't we use the camera? Compress. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, if you'd like to stay standing, you may. But we're going to take a few minutes to mill about. Um, we've got cookies and water. Uh, nothing more sophisticated than that. But uh, let's take about five minutes to um, just interact a little bit if you'd like. If not, we're going to be starting up in five minutes and I'm going to ask that you guys uh, step out unless you want to stay for the meeting. This will be your opportunity to have your night back. So thank you. So we'll get going in another five minutes. 747. Oh, I'm going to get my picture in. Sorry, I'm late. Yeah, I'm going to reconvene, and then I want to say a couple of words back to you. Okay. Yeah, come. Thank you for being here. Uh, so right now, we're going to hang out. And then I'll... Oh, I love the power.
uh, suggest that those who I honored, those who I honored can step out. We do have one honoree who showed up. I definitely want to call out. He's an important person at the back. But uh, hang on, Skylar. Just give me a second on that. Um, those of you who don't want to stick around, this is your opportunity to step out. Um, thanks, Erica. Bye. So, uh, Skylar, why don't you come on up? I, 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 I want to say a few words about uh, somebody uh, also very important and, and dear to us. I have something for you, too. A certificate. Will you frame it, put it in your house, and, you know. <laughs> so Skyler uh, has uh, thankfully taken the helm of the Irving Parent-Teacher uh, Organization. Yes, that's a biggie. Um, because they're very dependent on the PTO for a variety of things, social events. Um, was the strawberry welcome back your, was that a PTO function? The, there wasn't, okay, strawberry forgive me. That was, it must have been a pre-K thing. Um, but uh, I read, do you recall recently, by the way, whether you realize it or not, on a Saturday as I was getting my coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, I saw you and the PTO having a welcome back barbecue in the playground. Aww. And I texted Megan. I said, wow, what's going on on a Saturday? She said, oh, the PTO came out. Skylar organized everybody to have a, uh, a barbecue. So thank you for, for putting all that time in. Um, you have been very visible, very present. Uh, I have been at the Irving School quite a bit. I make my rounds. I do my walkthroughs. And oftentimes, you're there. So I don't know where you're finding the time, but I greatly appreciate all that time that you're putting in. So thank you very much for, for participating. <laughs> And if you'd like a cookie, you're welcome to take one. <laughs> you're also welcome to stay. Scott, um, you or you can head out if you'd like. Scott. You won't be offended. Scott, do you want yeah, to do another picture? Take, yeah, let's do that too. Sorry, hang on one second. I'm going to have to Photoshop the picture into the, to the group. No, I won't do that. I'm putting a website together, a web page for the website. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm old school with that background stuff. And uh, Chris, you read my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, with that, I'm not going to sit. Uh, I've got more to, to do, more to present. Um, I'm very appreciative of somebody who looks all too familiar to us. Here again with her husband and her daughter. Uh, Nicole Krupski will be formally recommended tonight um, by the uh, personnel committee headed tonight by Chris Woodward to be our next supervisor of funded programs and district initiatives and, and, and you know, we were talking about the title, it's very long. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, um, the call is going to be taking Jennifer Knapp's position as Jen Knapp has been uh, moved to the Bartle principalship. Uh, Nicole's position begins September 1. We were extremely fortunate to find a rock star to replace a rock star. Very big shoes to fill, um, but we did find somebody who will step in on September 3rd, the very first day teachers uh, report back. So uh, I'll be recommending via um, Dr. Woodward that Nicole begin her work September 1st as the supervisor. She was selected by um, a, uh, a, a series of committees that met her and several other candidates. We had a competitive pool, so she definitely earned this spot on her own. She wasn't, uh, wasn't an inside job of any kind. It was a true process that was implemented with great fidelity. I did ask Nicole to say a few words. So she has a speech, shouldn't it be about 10, 15 minutes? No. <laughs> you, want to use, you want to use the podium or the wireless mic? It's up to you. Well then use the wireless mic. Um, I'm very grateful to be given this opportunity. Um, Scott asked me to talk about my why and I have been a teacher for 23 years, 16 of them in Highland Park, and I have found my home here. And I love your kids, and I love the opportunities that Highland Park have afforded me. And with those opportunities, this new endeavor, I am very excited to uh, be taking over this role and to continue helping more of our students with this role.
So traditionally what has happened is the supervisor to be has waited for the resolution to pass. If that doesn't, you don't have to wait. It could, <laughs> I might not be till like 9.30 till that happens. So um, I'll reach out and Perfect. text you if you would like to slip out, okay? So you can either do so now or you can wait, up to you. Um, Thanks next, for coming I'd out, like guys. To, Good night. I'm sorry. Good night. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, some very special students who approached me. Um, thanks to Irene Marks. I think Irene, did Irene get you involved in all that? Yeah. So Irene Marks, as many of us know, spearheaded our move towards being a sustainable, a Jersey sustainable school district. Um, and uh, has really been a force behind our push to um, protect the environment save money through energy costs, and also educate students about uh, important environmental issues. Well, Irene reached out to three of our students um, about attending, well, actually a, a whole bunch of folks, three stepped up about attending a school food waste summit sponsored by Rutgers University. Uh, three students stepped, to the stepped up to the plate, represented Highland Park. I believe, I was told that you were the only students present in all the land at this event. Um, and so they met with me. Um, the three students, by the way, are, um, I should know this by heart, but forgive me, I've got a lot of names in my head. Um, Joyce C. Moe, who's here, Samantha uh, Perellis, who couldn't be here, and um, Olivia Parker, who's also um, been working with me on another activity, um, a TEDx event that we're trying to put together in December. More to come on that. So, um, Joycey and uh, Olivia are going to uh, step up to the mic in just a minute and share via a presentation I'm going to put on the uh, screen their experiences and a plan they have to help us do a better job do something with all that food that is left over in our cafeteria. So, you guys want to step up and, um, and maybe you could introduce our guest as well. Okay. Um, Hi, I'm Olivia Parker. I'm Joyce Mo. Um, and then we also brought with us uh, Mrs. Shakaitis, who's going to help us answer any questions. She's a um, she was actually uh, one of the leaders at the Rutgers Food Summit, so she's definitely been helping us with this endeavor and making sure that we are able to create as much change as possible. Right, so I'm just going to wait a few minutes for the slideshow to load. There we go. So we're here to talk about what we learned at this Food Waste Reduction Summit. Slide. So we learned a few statistics that I want to share. Uh, I just want to share two, really. So we learned that over one million residents in New Jersey are food insecure, and over one third of that are children. And on the other hand, we have 31% uh, of the overall U.S. food supply at the retail and consumer level went uneaten in 2010. That's over uh, $161 billion worth of food being wasted. So we have this weird disparity where there are a lot of people going hungry, yet there's so much food being wasted. Uh, so our goal is to focus on combating that weird disparity where there are people who are hungry and yet there are also people uh, wasting a lot of food. Um, it's just excess food. So uh, mostly we're going to be combating hunger and food insecurity among students, reducing school waste, um, as well as improving Highland Park sustainability. So for the first part of our solution, uh, we learned about something called a share table at the summit. It's literally a table where people can share food. <laughs> so uh, basically students can bring up food that they don't want to eat as long as it's unopened, um, uneaten obviously. They can put that on a table and other students who might still be hungry can go on up and take that food for free. Oh, okay. So we over the course of our experience, we've been meeting with many people, all these different representatives from each school. And we've sort of come to the conclusion that every school has a unique set of problems that we need to address. So we've tried to come up with a plan that we can use to target every school to make sure that every school in our district is as um, 
is reducing the least amount of food as possible. So we started with Irving, um, and we found out that they have snack every morning or afternoon. And uh, some kids don't have a snack and are left hungry. Um, and obviously, as Joyce mentioned, we don't want kids to be hungry. Um, so we want to collect food in the cafeteria that's left over um, from lunch. And then we will keep that food, send it to the nurse's office, and then the nurse can then um, distribute it to the children, and they can come down to her to his or her office um, for snack every every morning or afternoon. Um, as for Bartle, we've talked to um, another representative from that school, and we've learned that there's a lot of food that just doesn't get served. You know, it's still the the cafeteria employees are just there, and they're dishing out this food, but there's a lot left over that the kids, you know, don't even get to eat because they still have it. And so our, our solution to this was to bag up any leftover food or to have them bag up leftover food. And they can send it home with um, children in need if they're on free or reduced lunch or anything of that nature. Um, we've also learned that uh, the second graders have lunch first, but the fifth graders have lunch last. But they all have the same serving size. So this kind of led us um, to the conclusion that if we did incorporate a share table like Joyce has previously mentioned, uh, it would be effective in this way because you know, I wouldn't expect a second grader to eat as much food as a fifth grader, so if they are wasting any food, it can then go to the older kids who you would expect would need a little bit more calories in their diet. Um, so moving on to the middle school, our basic plan with this is to establish a share table. Since it's an older um, like level of students, we don't expect that it needs as much um, staff involvement in this to be successful. And a share table is super easy to set up. In fact, going on to the high school, we already have one there set up by the National Honor Society. Uh, they've done a really good job with sort of like already starting the solution. But we just want to um, make it a little bit better. A lot of kids don't really know about it, so we would like to improve some signage, you know, get awareness about it out. And uh, Joyce actually came up with this, um, composting any leftover food. So obviously the share table really targets the idea of a kid doesn't open anything or touch something, so it gets thrown away. But there's food that's, you know, like an apple that's only been taken a bite out of. That still gets wasted, and it's still, you know, very wasteful. But you're not able to give a kid, you know, an apple with a bite out of it. So the great thing about composting is you're able to, you know, use that food productively. And, and this also works for wood, because we have a set department that builds for the musicals, for the plays. They build, you know, all these amazing sets. But there's a lot of scraps of wood. So this is another effective way to use that. Okay, and this is kind of going off what I was talking about a little bit earlier. So there's different levels and ways that we want to target um, food waste. So the, the best possible thing to do is to just, in general, reduce food waste. So if we can get kids to stop throwing away food, that obviously solves our problem. But the next best, best thing is to donate any extra food that we have left over. And then, uh, obviously, below that is to feed animals. But we're not going to, you know, really do that because we don't have it access to any animals to feed, but we will be composting, and obviously the, the worst case scenario in this is just putting the food in the landfill, which is what this whole endeavor is trying to avoid. Okay, so we're, we, we anticipate having leftover food. With the share table, um, we want kids to donate as much as possible, but sometimes there's a little bit of a stigma about walking up to a, a table and taking people's leftover food. You know, they might be a little bit embarrassed doing this. Um, so we hope that there's, well, we, we don't hope, but, you know, we anticipate that there will be extra food left over. And there's different things that we can do with this because, obviously, we don't want to take the food that we've collected and just waste it. So our best um, option is to offer it to any students in need, like we talked about, bagging up food and giving it to them. But another solution we can do is using it for aftercare programs. So I know especially at, like, Bartle and Irving, there's these programs after school, and so we'd love to to use any food that we collect and give it to them. Um, the, next, the next option is to give it to athletic programs. I play on the girls soccer team at the high school and I know that like when we ride the bus home from games, you know, we're all really hungry because it's like five o'clock so I think anyone would appreciate, you know, like a, a snack or something to, to eat basically. Um, and then the next option would be to donate it to the Highland Park Food Pantry. We've actually been in touch with the director of the food pantry and she's willing to sort of collect any non-perishable items that, that we do have, so um, that's another great solution. Um, so in order for this to work, we obviously have all these ideas, but we need to execute it and make sure that it's as, as successful as possible. So I think the best thing to do is to make sure that everyone's on the same page, because 
we all have different lunch periods, and if it's just one person in a school doing this, it's not going to you know, be a uniform thing throughout the rest of the lunch periods. Um, so we talked to Dr. Taylor, we actually mentioned this to him, and actually Mrs. Shikaitis was willing to help us with this, to set up just a quick like after school, an hour or so, to have like lunch aids, staff, just teachers in general, come learn a little bit about how they can best help us reduce food waste, um, and sort of take that knowledge and incorporate it into their lives as uh, helping with the cafeteria. So yeah, that's something that will be in the works hopefully in September, but that's about it. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to address them to Joyce and I, and also um, Mr. Shikaitis, who's here to help us. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, could you come on up? So Jennifer Sh Sh Shikaitis? Shikaitis. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer and I have actually worked before together, uh, thanks to her involvement with Mr. Sclafani's class to, I think, Olivia, were you both in that too? The, the class that was working with Jennifer and Mr. Sclafani on the um, uh, personal wellness turkey? Okay, so we have a group of students that Mr. Sclafani is working with who will uh, implement lessons for their peers on personal wellness efforts. Uh, I just, you know, I thought I'd just say a couple of words about who you are, sure. and then I'll give the mic back to, to, to the students. Um, so Jennifer is, the, is a family and community health science, sciences educator. This is her seventh year with Rutgers. If th this is accurate, I believe, because it's from two months ago. Yes. <laughs> um, she's a faculty member officially in the Department of Family and Community Health Science at Rutgers. But a big part of her work is outreach, which is one reason why she's spending her time with us uh, tonight. So, uh, and, and I do appreciate that you have a master's degree in public health from NYU. That's no... Um, that's nothing to, to, uh, to, to look away at. So I'm going to give the mic back to Olivia in case anybody has questions. Okay, any questions? I just, just want to say I'm blown away. You guys did an amazing job. And this is such a fantastic project to take on. And like not a small project to take on either. And it's clear you guys have already done an incredible amount of follow-up after doing this program. So like kudos to you both. And whatever we can do to help support you guys and what you're doing, just let us know. All right, thank you. <laughs> can I, as, can as a mom who hates food waste, I just want to say thank you for doing what we do at our house, you know, like supporting what we do, and I think a lot of other families in town, and I would like to ask some advice because I feel like plenty of people have lots of good ideas, and, you know, we see these things happening, and we don't know how to get involved. How did you get involved with Ms. Chikadis? I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Okay. Rhymes with bronchitis. Shikaitis. Sorry, Shikaitis. sorry, Shikaitis. Um, so how did you make that relationship happen and get this actually, you know, in action, this plan? So I mean, Mark, some su sustainable Highland Park invited me to the food reduction, food waste reduction summit, and that's where I met uh, Mr. Kaitis. Um, but also, I'm part of the National Honor Society, where Ms. Moore, the advisor, was like, hey, National Honor Society members. There's a summit. You guys want to go? Um, apparently, only two people applied for that, uh, one of them being me, and another girl was actually sick that day. Um, so it ended up being like two influences trying to get me to go to the summit, Ms. Ma and um, Eileen Marks. Um, as for me, I kind of came late to the party. Like Joyce was the one more organizing this, but uh, it was put out to the whole environmental club, which I'm a part of, and so I was sort of interested um, in it through that, and I try to do a lot, like in all the clubs I'm involved in, to sort of get on board with all these initiatives. Um, yeah, so I was invited th also through Irene um, to the summit, and from there we learned a lot, um, just about everything and what we can do, and I think I was personally inspired to sort of take this on. I think just the idea of food, good food being wasted is a little bit like, it's a little bit frustrating, so I think that was sort of, you know, why I got involved in it. So I have one quick suggestion and one quick question. So my quick suggestion is another place that I think stuff could possibly go and somebody else that you could contact is there's an after school program called The Cave in town. Oh, yeah. And I think they would always be thrilled to have any kind of donations for um, the after school program that they run. Um, so if you guys were to get in touch with those folks over there at the um, Unitarian Church. No, no not Unitarian. Reformed. Reformed, thank you. Sorry, wrong church at the Reformed Church. I think they'd be uh, 
really grateful for any donations as well. And then my question was, do you guys have a spot staked out for composting? Because I don't know that we do any composting currently, do we? Because I, I think that's one of like, to me, that's one of the most exciting ideas. And I, but I think also one of the most difficult because it requires getting students to purposefully put their food in different places where at the end of lunch, you're all like, Wah! and then just want to walk out. So I'm just wondering if that's, you know, all right, so in Irving, there's already composting going on. Led Mrs. By, Zara. Yes, Mrs. Zara. Kudos to Mrs. Zara, like the composting hero. That's like a job in Mrs. Zara's kindergarten class. It's like the most brilliant thing ever. It's on and, the job wheel. And I'm trying to start composting at the high school level. Uh, there's already a composting bin in oh. the high school garden. It's just not being used. So I figured, Great. why don't we use it? Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Great. I, I just wanted to add, just to echo everyone, I am just in love with this whole idea. I can't wait to see how this grows and evolves, and I think that we're going to see children going home and telling their parents and their siblings, don't throw that out, you know, let's not waste. Um, and I'm curious to see how many other ch students, I shouldn't say children, want to get involved. Do you plan on like doing this as a club or thinking about making this... Um, I don't know, a part of another club, I can just see this sort of yeah. really catching fire um, at, at all the schools, really. So, so far, in terms of the whole school district, it's mainly been, been like Olivia, Samantha, me, uh, in terms of like the students. Okay. Um, but in terms of the clubs, at the high school share table, it's managed by the National Honor Society, which is like a right. weird club in the school. And I talked to Ms. Moore, um, about having National Honor Society collaborate with the Environmental Club to expand the share table program. Good. So Good. it is already being expanded uh, to have other clubs p um, be part of it. Yeah. Cool. Wonderful. Well, I would love it if you guys came at the end of the year and gave us an update. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be great. Another, um, I think, club that might be interested in this is uh, Key Club, which I'm also involved in, and uh, a big, like, we try to raise money for all these different organizations, and a big one is, um, hunger in New Jersey, so I think this sort of can go along with that. So I'll make sure to get them involved as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. another uh, uh, as you said, animals. There is a little zoo over at Johnson's Park that could probably use the vegetables or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys so much. Um, speak, uh, by the way, this is your opportunity if you'd like to step out to do so. Uh, speaking of students, uh, we often, well, I don't think we've ever actually honored a student in our student spotlight section of my presentation. Uh, during the summer, but I thought it would be uh, a good opportunity to do so tonight because I actually was involved in an experience that the board backed that I think is worth recapping uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. for four days. So I'm going to ask Andy to come on up and uh, join me as we talk a little bit about what we did for four days, exhausting four days. Uh, I'm going to start by sharing a couple of slides and I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, to Andy. Uh, first, uh, just a very brief video that kind of encapsulates why Andy went down there from the get. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're here on behalf of the Commanding General of the Marine Corps Recruit Command to welcome you to this year's Battles One Academy. But what we try and do with the Battles One Academy is we try and identify not only standout athletes who are very strong academically and have given back to their community in some way. I'm really proud of what the Marine Corps did here. This is an outstanding event. It just opens up our horizons for learning and becoming a better leader. With these teams, though, we have a group for squad leaders. They'll be with you through all activities and everything that you do. I'm so thankful that they took the time out of their schedule to teach us the ropes and learn more about the profession. We do things called Marshall Public Studies inside of our program. We are heading to the World War II Memorial. Are you here? All right, let's go. I got it. I'm here with Joseph Lewin. He asked me to go on this, and I was completely honored to have this experience. And this has by far blown my mind. We are all part of a team, and we need that team to get 
So Andrew was uh, selected as uh, an all-American uh, athlete by the Marine Corps, uh, and uh, I was honored to be asked as his mentor to come with him for uh, but the trip down to Washington, um, some photos that we had a chance to take with each other. Uh, one of the great opportunities that I had was to mingle with other mentors. There were about, uh, well, I think there were 100 mentors total um, throughout the country. A lot of coaches, uh, guidance counselors. Uh, I don't think there were any superintendents there. I think I might have been the only one, but uh, <laughs> but we definitely had one thing in common, and that is that we were all in the business of supporting students like Andy um, and his peers who want to make a difference in the world and um, had some of their own challenges they had to fight past and figured out how to do that and be all the better for it. So, um, so with that, I want Landy to talk about his experiences, show you some slides, got some videos, go from there. Um, well, thank you for having me. Uh, this, this trip was about five days. Um, it's, it was actually formally called the Battles One Academy. Um, and again, we were down in DC. They were, the Marine Corps uh, were uh, nice enough to fly us down, um, but we ran into our own battle on the way down uh, of a storm. So we were delayed, canceled, and we rode an Uber all the way down in the back of a Mitsubishi Lancer. So it wasn't the most comfortable ride, but um, it was the longest Uber ride I think I'm going to have in my life. Um, so just from the pictures, I mean, there's great visuals. They did a, a phenomenal job documenting this. Um, and, and so did Dr. Taylor, uh, by the way. He was so supportive with, with taking photos. I'm um, really glad he did. Uh, so, you know, we were at the uh, National Archives in the top left photo, um, which was really cool. It was like a banquet style event. Uh, they catered, um, uh, they actually shut down where the, uh, the Constitution and Declaration are. Um, it was a really cool exclusive experience that I didn't know about. It wasn't really uh, something that I came in knowing, um, but I'm so glad I got to see our nation's history, right? Um, and we did some fun stuff too. So <laughs> uh, there are a lot of um, sites that we saw, uh, like uh, different memorials, museums. We had the Marine Corps Museum uh, on the bottom right. Uh, we actually had a night, I believe it was the second or the third night, where we were allowed to walk around, roam around DC. Um, and we, uh, it, it's kind of crazy. I, you go down and uh, there's about 96 this year that went down, uh, as in students, and they all had their mentors, right? So. Um, being in a big room with, with people that you know who, who play sports or academics or they, you know, they, they won a battle in their life, it was so easy to sit down with someone and, and talk to them, right? get to know them. Um, so we ended up having a pretty big group. Uh, they actually separated us uh, into what's called Team Quezon. Um, they did the team names by battles that the Marines fought. Um, and we were, we were a part of a great, great team led by a great sergeant. Um, and we really got to mingle together. So on, on we took this picture outside the White House. Um, to be honest, there's some people in the picture that, like one, one of the few in the back, I don't remember uh, really talking to them that much, but we were that friendly where it was just, hey, jump in a photo, right? So um, it really, it's not, <laughs> it's not always like that, uh, especially now, you know, in the social media age where you kind of, you're, you're more confined in yourself, but it was, it was amazing to be able to just have that friendliness um, we also did a lot of PT, right? <laughs> so it is the Marine Corps, they do uh, highlight athletes, so they wanted to see us um, push ourselves. Um, on the right is, uh, we, we, they drove us down, we had to get up at 4.30 in the morning, I, I believe we arrived at, at maybe close to 11 the night before, uh, got everything done, registered, uh, I was in bed by like 1 in the morning, I had to get up, <laughs> we got on coach buses, and we went straight to Marine Corps Base Quantico, which is the crossroads of Marine Corps officers. Um, every officer goes there to train, and we were allowed that firsthand experience um, to PT with, uh, with drill instructors. And on the left, which is really cool, uh, we did the elk course. So uh, it's, I don't know if this describes it well, but uh, it was a wooden, um, obstacle course uh, that the Marines have to run. It's almost, it's close to what they call their confidence course, which builds their confidence, but this really challenges you physically. It took a lot of upper body strength. Um, and I believe this is the video. I'm not sure. Do I hit the yeah. middle? 
Okay. Uh, Come on. No. No. Looks like a picture. Am I hitting the right button? <laughs> So uh, we, I was selected uh, by my group. We needed one boy and one girl to run the course as a relay. Um, and it, it was a struggle. So I had my team coming with me the entire time. They were falling on the side. Um, all I could hear was just support, right? Uh, and it, it, we got to run it a few times individually, but it was physically strenuating and, and you're mentally tired. Um, and up until this point, I was doing pretty well. And uh, you hit a wall and you learn to get over the wall, right? So it's, it's, a, it's an accurate representation of what, what they wanted us to mentally have. Um, and you can see everyone else sprinting back to get their partners. Um, this part might look easy, but I was really, <laughs> really gassed at the end of it. Um, I, was, I couldn't breathe. Um, it was one of those, it was hot, it was humid. We hiked through the woods in, in, the, in the camis, which you can't breathe through. <laughs> um, and. I kind of got to this point where, you know, I knew you just had to keep going. And one of the things I had, a, I had an instructor with us, um, and he he just told me he was like, "You got to just jump up there, get it over with." And that I did. <laughs> I, I have um, to add that you were Andy was one of I think only eight. Yeah. Uh, who did the this? Relay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stepped up. So yeah, we were the only. Uh, the eight of us, we ran the course in its entirety. Uh, everyone else kind of, they did partial stuff, um, and it was your squad leader, so it was our sergeant, Sergeant Milky, who uh, decided who she wanted. Um, and yeah, and that, that, this is the end where uh, you're supposed to climb the rope or you're <laughs> supposed to do uh, burpees, for those who can't climb. Uh, I did burpees. Um, <laughs> I, I tried. Uh, it took a little bit. It's a learning curve. I, I, <laughs> um, so right after that, we actually entered the big, the big auditorium uh, there on base. Uh, we spoke with, um, I believe, uh, one of the leaders of, uh, of just basic training at the basic school. Uh, I think he, he may have ran the school. I'm not quite sure of his rank, so I don't want to put it out there. But um, they sat us in this big room. He gave us this, um, this, this kind of talk on life, right? Um, what you would expect down at a leadership academy. Um, and eventually, they gave us MREs uh, to eat. Um, this was a really cool experience for me. I've seen them, uh, I've heard about them, but I haven't actually gotten to taste it or use it. And for those that don't know, it's a, it's a very basic learning curve. Um, you have water and it heats up and you put things inside that pouch and eventually you get hot food from it, right? Um, and these, it's supposed to last you uh, in, in, you know, in, in crises or, or battles. So it was a lot of calories you put in by not really eating too much. Um, and it was just a really, it was overall a cool experience. I kept the MRE bag. I brought it home with me. I really wanted to remember that. Um, and we also did USA Wrestling for a day. So uh, USA Wrestling is national wide. Uh, uh, they, they do wrestling from little, you know, all the way from the little kids at high schoolers to college. And um, they, they were very instructional. We learned different types of wrestling. But this was one of the physical things. So it was almost like CrossFit uh, for any, any CrossFitters here, uh, where it was a lot of, you know, using your own body strength and being able to throw weights around and, and, <laughs> and be active in that sense. So we were on wrestling mats. We were at American University, uh, and it was cool as an athlete. I know that they're a D1 school, so being on, you know, D1 wrestling mats. But, you know, I, I also wrestle in the high school, so it was a cool experience. I got to wrestle a former Penn, a former Penn State wrestler. Um, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a really cool experience to meet someone at such a high level. Uh, we right afterwards we actually did a community service event. Um, so part of the one of the pillars of this uh, of, of this um, trip was community service. And you know a few years ago they did a cleanup um, around D.C., which um, I, I believe I think they may have also done the bike, but um, this was a bike build. So we had the boys and girls club come down, uh, different you know. Uh, different kids uh, from all ages between probably early teens to all the way down to maybe six years old. Um, they came in, they actually, after we built the bikes, they stormed in um, and they, they got to see all of us. Um, we, each team had to build two bikes. Uh, we, our team actually, I think we had the best team. Um, we exemplified great teamwork. Uh, I know 
you can even see that <laughs> Dr. Taylor is busy reading the instructions. Uh, he picked up the instructions and he, he told us what needed to go where. Um, we, had a, we, we had some mentors, uh, we were instructed to make kind of like a welcome sign and, and we, we split that up as well. Um, and you know, it takes, it honestly took probably three of us to build at least one bike and having a whole team, we knew how to communicate. We were the first bike to be, to pass the safety inspection, which I took pride in. Uh, I think this is the video of um, the kids running in. And uh, some of the signs had their names on it. Like, unfortunately, uh, one, of our, one of our bikes didn't have a child directly associated with it that was going to be brought back and they were going to distribute it um, in their own way. Um, and then our other child didn't show up. But we had their name, so they were getting that bike regardless. So they, they were going to get the sign, the card. It was very personalized for them. Um, it was just, it was a really, it was an awesome experience to be able to be a part of such an organized uh, community event. Um, we do a lot of things in town, within the school even, um, but it's on a very small level. And, and to be in a room with, you know, I, I personally, I had a roommate who was from Hawaii. Uh, we had people from Kansas, uh, I, California even, and we were all just across the nation. We came to this one room, in D, one gymnasium in DC, and we built bikes. Um, I thought that was an extremely cool experience that I definitely would not have been able to accomplish without this program. And um, so on the last night, we had a banquet. Uh, and. We had some speakers, uh, most notably uh, James Conner, who is a running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He battled cancer, um, and he almost lost his life. Um, he came back from many injuries, and he ended up getting drafted. So um, to hear from someone who looked death in, in, in you know, right, who faced death, and came back and still did something and achieved their lifelong dream and is successful in it and takes pride in it, it was, I got emotional listening to it, um, you know, and. It was, it was amazing just hearing them speak, uh, very inspiring. And then towards the end, they did the, uh, the, you know, the little awards. Um, we, there was the best mentor. Um, I believe there was another award, I can't remember. And then the last two were the Max Preps uh, High School Athletes of the Year. Um, and then that also kind of meshed in with All American of the Year. Um, and there was a male winner and there was a female winner. And I took home the male prize, um, which ended up being a $20,000 scholarship. <laughs> um, there's some pictures that, that they took. I was, I was absolutely, like, just, I was shocked. I was, like, on the verge of tears standing on the stage. And this, this stage was no joke. Um, <laughs> it was a temporary stage, um, but they, they had, like, a whole row of fog lights coming down. I believe they were, it was, it was a production level uh, stage. And, um, you know, being up there, I, I really couldn't see much, but I looked down to my left and I saw Dr. Taylor right, right at the table. He was, he was my number one fan in the room. Um, it was amazing. I mean, I, I walked up there after they said it and I, I just saw him jumping around and, it, oh, like it was, it was a great, it was, it was something great. Um, I think I embarrassed myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, that, those are our visuals. Um, I just have to say that before going down, um, you know, obviously, I, so the timeline, I, I was notified of this um, around March, so springtime. I put in, I, I was actually recommended by um, another athlete in the class above me from Matter Day in California. Um, and we know each other just through, you know, athletes uh, connecting. And um, he, he won the award the year before me. And he, he, he said, there's no better person. You know, he kind of just pushed it out there. And, I, I took it and I ran with it and I didn't, I honestly didn't expect to hear anything back. It was one of those things. Um, and then, you know, after going down, I learned a lot about myself. Um, I learned about how much I could push myself and what I could bring back to my community. I, that's, that was in my mind the whole time. Um, I talked to Dr. Taylor a little bit. I, I said that one of the greatest things about having your superintendent there is if you see something that you like or that, you know, your school could benefit from, he's the guy. He'll see it firsthand. I, um, and, a part of me feels like, you know, I, I sort of thought I had my life all figured out, right? Like, you know, I'm 17, I think all 17 year olds <laughs> sit down and they think, oh, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z for the next X amount of years. And uh, for me, I think that's just my personality. But I learned down there that the Marine Corps was something that I actually wanted to pursue. Uh, before I went down, I, 
I kind of resented the idea. I feared the idea. I didn't know too much about it. Um, but speaking, we, we had an hour-long uh, block where it was called um, Planning Your Future. And I spoke with uh, people who worked in advertising, people who were college admissions from regular colleges, naval admissions officers, uh, ROTC uh, officers. Um, and I spent the most amount of time talking with the Naval Academy and, and ROTC. Um, so the moment I got back home, <laughs> I started my apps for the Naval Academy and I started my apps and I'm currently going through the process of uh, applying for the NROTC scholarship. Um, I, I kind of realized that uh, the right move for me um, and, and where I want to grow as a person, as a leader, would be within the Marine Corps. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, um, I would potentially get into ROTC or the Naval Academy and commission as an officer uh, after four years of college. Uh, so kind of took that from uh, this trip. Any questions? Anybody? No, thank wow. you so much. Wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And amazing. you get a whole year to, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> let us know how you're doing on this path. So uh, I we'll, just wanted to know if uh, Dr. Taylor took it easy on the Marines. I thought I answered that. Let that one go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, All right. Thanks for being here, my friend. I'll see you. So, you know, Andy will be our uh, port rep. So, we'll be seeing him plenty. Awesome. All right, Andy. Enjoy the you last go home. bit of your summer. And thanks for being out here, Olivia. Um, I'm going to wrap up my, my portion of the board meeting, which is going along now. Forgive me. To just share a couple of highlights, like I do every August. Um, that we should look forward to as we move into the uh, opening of the school year, which will be September 5th, half day for students. Our teachers will be returning on the 3rd and the 4th. Uh, a couple of things I want to put the wraps on. Our honors distinction initiative continues. Uh, we are all in to implement the grade 11 Eng English uh, honors distinction program. The uh, distinction uh, title replaces what we used to call the honors option program. So we're now calling it Honors Distinction. Curriculum has been written. Um, we have provided thorough, comprehensive professional development to the teachers. And uh, we're all good. We're all in. Um, there was a question that came to my attention from some in the community who heard that our middle school physical education program was going to run every other day. Um, that's not going to be the case. Just want to confirm with everybody on camera who are present that there's no change to the physical education schedule moving forward. It'll meet daily. A couple other things I want to bring up. Um, as I'm sure we all recall, uh, we, we had our share of challenges, particularly at the middle school, um, with uh, uh, bias incidences. And um, Mrs. O has done a wonderful job um, swooping around these, those, those issues and uh, instituting some, some programs. One I want to highlight that is a full go is a uh, collaborative with a group at Brookdale called the Center for Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights uh, Center. I'm sorry, it is the Center for Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights. Um, I used to be on the board of this group back in the day when it was called the, Holo uh, the Brookdale um, Center for Holocaust Studies. So they've expanded their scope of work to um, encompass anti-bias, anti-hate uh, education. And so we're actually going to be a partner with them, one of, I think, two schools now in the state working with them, uh, to implement something called Building Bridges, which will involve all of our eighth grade students. It'll include year-long workshops. I'll give you a little snapshot of what the agenda could look like. This is a draft but was presented to us. Um, we're going to probably scale it back a little bit. The uh, costs will um, be picked up by two things, uh, Title I funds, which are federal grant monies, and also a grant that the center has received to fund these programs in schools. So there'll be no cost to the district op uh, through the operational budget. It'll all come out of grants. Um, moving forward, I, um, I feel that uh, it's, it's a good time since many of um, our members of the community received my 7 p.m. Honeywell about the one-to-one -one initiative to talk in detail about the initiative. 
Uh, besides the Honeywell that went out tonight at 7 p.m., which just gives everybody a, a little a brief on what's coming, I will provide a more detailed letter, snail mail, the old-fashioned way, as well as digital, August 26th, next Monday, um, in, in which I'll list the dates that I'm listing here, as well as include some forms that um, our parents and guardians are going to have to sign off on the middle high school level. One such date is uh, September 12th. That's when Dr. Nikosia, our STEM supervisor, and I are going to hold what we call a pre-implementation orientation meeting. It's an opportunity for anybody who has questions about the one-to-one -to, -one to come on out. It'll be 7 p.m. Uh, in the high school cafeteria, September 12th. Again, more details will be in the letter going out next week. Um, the, the machines, the Chromebooks, will actually be provided to all of our high school families who appear at back to school night on that night, which is September 26th, and for middle school uh, families on October 10th. That's not middle school back to school night, it's a separate evening. Um, those families who don't pick up the Chromebooks then will have the opportunity, obviously, to, uh, to get them later from the high school media center. We're going to be keeping uh, a list of those who uh, picked up their books, their Chromebooks, and those who haven't, so we can follow up with anybody who didn't show on September 26th or October uh, 10th. Uh, a couple more things I want to add. We will be asking um, folks to sign two forms, a, um, a contract of sorts. It's sort of like the acceptable use po uh, policy sign-off sheet that we ask our students to sign every year. This is a little more detailed because it pertains to the initiative, the Chromebook initiative. Uh, we're also going to be uh, offering um, voluntary insurance sign-up for anybody who would like to take out some extra damage insurance. Uh, it's going to be $40 for those who do not qualify for free and reduced lunch. All of our uh, families who do qualify for free lunch will automatically be enrolled in this insurance. Details about the insurance uh, plan are on the form, but essentially it covers some, uh, some of those things that could happen if you drop the crow book, if, uh, if uh, somebody bumps into it, uh, if you spill water onto the keyboard, the um, insurance program will, will pick up most of that cost. Uh, also, a shout out to the Highland Park Education Association, the um, support staff, teachers, secretary, uh, collective bargaining unit. They have agreed to use their grant monies to purchase cases for all of the Chromebooks, protective cases. Yeah. Big shout out. Um, Keith Presti, the president of the association, is leading this initiative, this charge. He met with us today to talk about logistics. Um, we'll be handing those cases out with the Chromebooks themselves when they go out. Uh, he's also, by the way, going to be providing um, food. Actually, actually, like food food, not just <laughs> figure food, but hot food. Um, at those events, so, uh, so thanks again to HPEA for that. I'm going to wrap up um, my, some of my school launch highlights by um, circling back to something I've mentioned over the last couple of months, and that's a change to the Bardo schedule. Um, well, actually, multiple changes, the first of which uh, is going to um, have probably more of an impact on the teachers than the kids, and that's uh, departmentalization of the grades four and five um, subjects. Uh, what that means is our teachers will now be um, having kids uh, move to uh, another classroom for certain subjects like math and language arts so that our teachers can be specialists in those subject areas at grades four and five. The teachers rooms are right next to each other so kids aren't going to be wandering all the way down the hall. They won't have to fish around for where the class is. They'll be right there. The reason why we're departmentalizing, and by the way, this was by choice of the, of the vast majority of teachers, we didn't dictate this, um, is because we are preparing for the 2020-2021 redesign of the middle school math program that will have us um, integrating the, uh, the on level and what was previously the, the below level um, classes, sixth grade math classes into one class. And so to do that, we need to better prepare our students beginning in the fourth and fifth grades. And to do that, our faculty, including, uh, and our leadership team felt it was prudent to have our teachers become more specialized, particularly in math instruction than they have been in the past. 
So that's why we're departmentalizing. A letter will be going home from Ms. Knapp, the new Bartle principal, to parents to provide more details about this. The other change to the schedule doesn't have to do with departmentalization. It's a, a separate change is that we will be moving from 120 minutes of uh, instruction for English language arts to 90 minutes on average per day of instruction, from 120 minutes to 90 minutes. Um, we will be doing this uh, for several reasons, uh, one of which is, uh, frankly, um, the, the um, inability for us to hire additional faculty to cover some of our needs at um, some of our students' needs at Bartle School. Um, we did a survey of uh, many school districts around the area, the region, um, and it turns out that 90 minutes is actually the norm for English language arts in the vast majority of the schools we surveyed. However, recognizing that we'll be shifting from 120 minutes to 90 minutes, we do want to do something with the 30 minutes, so we've decided to build in what we refer to as um, read-alouds, specifically accountable talk read-alouds. That's a 30-minute period outside of the 90 minutes of more traditional English language arts instruction, during which the kids are going to read aloud with the teacher and be given uh, feedback about how they're reading. Um, they'll be doing it as whole groups. In some cases, they'll be doing it in pairs or in smaller groups. But that is going to comprise 30 of the um, minutes that we're, we're losing. Uh, I want to expand a little bit on the, on the read aloud concept. Uh, there will be times when the teachers will be incorporating many lessons, which will teach the kids new skills during those 30 minutes. Uh, and um, it's also an opportunity for teachers to, of course, model good reading habits and to encourage kids to foster an appreciation of reading. So that's what is going to comprise those 30 minutes that we are um, not including in the full 120 minute block now. So once again, we're moving from 120 minutes to, to 90 minutes. I'm gonna sit down um, because I have some additional notes in case there are questions that I can refer to on my computer. Are there any questions or comments from the board about anything I just discussed? Anybody? Nope. Well, if any, of course, if any come up after tonight, uh, feel free to email me and I'll be sure to follow up to an email. Okay. That concludes my lengthy report. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. Well, but lots of really good stuff. Um, I love seeing our students out and telling us about what they're doing. That's always fantastic to see, and it's always really important to um, recognize our volunteers, all of our volunteers. And there's so many other ones who weren't here tonight to be recognized. So to everyone who does anything for the district, is on any committee or um, any search process or whatever. I mean, anytime anyone takes time out to help us out with what we do, um, we just greatly appreciate it and want everyone to know how much we appreciate it. So thank you. Um, all right, so we will move on to our board committee reports. Start off with uh, curriculum and instruction with Michelle. Hello. Hello. I would um, try to keep it brief if I can, but there's quite a lot to catch up on. So do what you got to do. I'll do my best. Um, so we had our meeting on um, August the 12th, and uh, Monique was present. Rob could not make it. Um, the agenda started with the agenda review for tonight. And um, field trip requests, as usual, um, the second item is evaluation instruments for the district. And you can see the list on our agenda. Um, it's quite a long list but there is uh, no change from last year. So this is just uh, an annual review of the same evaluation tools that we need to approve um, in order to implement. Um, the next item is, um, oh, and I just wanted to mention that um, the district has an evaluation advisory committee that meets to discuss these evaluation tools three to four times a year. So it's not just um, our approval, but they're reviewing as they go. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And uh, the next item is the approval of the curricula and textbooks. Again, there's no changes here, but um, we did discuss the new one-to-one -one initiative allowing us to have fewer physical textbooks um, and uh, purchases of those textbooks. And 
I think as a committee, we all talked about our preference to have, um, you know, uh, sourced different uh, original sources used instead of textbooks. So there's any number of different things that could be used in place of those, you know, prefab type textbooks. But um, it was very clearly like our preference, I think, that as a committee, we wanted our teachers to be using original sources of fiction and nonfiction alike. Um, and teaching kids how to research and do critical thinking um, as they research. Um, because there is a lot of information available and it's not always clear what the quality of that information is. So part of our priority was to make sure that um, if we are approving any new textbooks or curricula, which we're not this time, but if we are, that we are trying our best to avoid um, using things that are you know, canned. We want to use original sources. Um, and then last item is the approval of the HIBs for the month of June. So um, during our committee meeting, we also talked about the follow-up to our conversation on consent and bodily autonomy in the elementary health curricula. So it came to my attention that um, we did not have an explicit lesson or unit on um, consent and bodily autonomy for primary and um, elementary school health curricula. Um, so that was important. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but the main reason is that we need to teach kids that uh, their body belongs to them and no one else is allowed to touch it without their permission. <laughs> and that is what we are um, talking about when we talk about consent. So it is not um, a sexual issue. It is more or less just um, uh, an issue of possession and individuality in that, that possession. So it was important for us. We did get an update and we did hear from Dr. Taylor that the um, information um, that we had wanted was distributed to all the applicable staff members in especially the, the PE and health teams in each building. So that was important for us to get follow up on. Um, and so as I understand it, that's been integrated into the health curriculum, right? Okay. Uh, number three, we had an update again on the impact of the budget cuts on scheduling. We just heard about that in Dr. Taylor's report about the ELA time at Bartle. Um, so it was interesting to see the, the math uh, for the week. There's a 450 minute chunk of time every single week that the Bartle students have for um, ELA, y even with the cuts. So um, again, this is not necessarily destructive, it's a change, and it's not something that um, some might be excited about, but it is something that we are managing as best we can, I think. So, when I told my third grade teacher husband that there were, there, there was formally the amount of time there was, he was just kind of like, I know. What would you do with that much time? That's, like he that's was kind been, of, I haven't been in a classroom in a while, but that right. was also my yeah. reaction. It's funny, because that's a whole lot of time. Yeah. And when you're talking about young students, you're talking about a whole lot of energy bottled up in that time. So, you know, a read aloud might allow kids to have a little bit more wiggle, like literally wiggle room. <laughs> I should also add that some, the teachers have also talked about incorporating, instead of a read aloud, the entire 30-minute 30 period, uh, 30 minute period, some extended responsive classroom, circle talks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's so much uh, you, stuff you could do at that time. Right, and I don't think that there's any, you know, dearth of um, ideas about how to fill that time. Right. There's a lot. So, um, so this, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, also, we had an update on our economics curriculum integration. So I'm just going to run through them really fast. This is mainly for the middle school. Um, so in grade six, we're going to have budget and savings. This would be covered nice. under cost benefit analysis and unit rates in the math class. This is sixth grade. In the seventh grade, also in the math class, we're going to have a, a study on credit and debt covered under positive and negative integers, hopefully more positive than negative. <laughs> grade eight, in the health curriculum, we're going to have the addition of insurance. So the idea of oh, wow. health insurance. So buckle up, kids. <laughs> uh, it's going to talk mainly about how health insurance works. So I hope that we talk about how health insurance doesn't work. I just want to make that very clear that that's a lot. 
um, of what the problems we have are. So good luck with that, eighth grade. And Makerspace, <laughs> Makerspace and Fuse is going to be talking about investment. Um, this will be covered under projects where students create and solve real world problems. There's plenty of those to solve. Thank you very much. And students will create projects that have an investment component. So one of our suggestions as a committee was that we talk in that unit on entrepreneurship in all different forms. Um, so I know that um, you know capitalism being what it is, we talk about investment and we think of big winner and loser. It, it's really that black and white, but um, one of our hopes was that we could talk about entrepreneurship not only in terms of creative problem solving, but also in terms of sharing the wealth. So, not many people know this, but there is a great number of businesses in northern Italy, in the Reggio Emilia um, province, where most of the businesses there are co-ops, which means that they are worker-owned. The management is the workforce, so that we are seeing like democracy in action in the workplace. So, rather than waiting every four years to vote, you are voting constantly about what your business does, how you spend your day, how much time you have um, dedicated to different uh, tasks. And a really good business in America that is a co-op that I was happy to introduce Dr. Taylor to was the Alvarado Street Bakery in California. And that's been around for decades. Um, their bread is sold in the freezer section of Stop and Shop in town. <laughs> and so Alvarado Street Bakery is actually an American co-op. So it is a democratized uh, business. Um, so I am happy to know that we are going to be including entrepreneurship in all different forms um, in the economics curriculum. Um, lastly, but not leastly, we had an update on the Center for Human Rights and Genocide Education um, Initiative Building Bridges for the eighth grade social studies course. And um, hopefully, um, it is as beautiful a uh, list of activities as it appears. We had a, a handout given, and it looked like there were just jam-packed uh, activities. I can't find it now, but... Was that the same one that Scott put up earlier? It was yeah. up there, but it was um, a detailed list of activities yeah. from August till June, yeah. so that it was integrated into every single month. It wasn't just... Um, Can we get a copy of that? Yes, I would. I Yay. wish I could find it right now, but I will get you a copy. Also, um, you know, it, it was the same concept that we all were talking about when we discussed integrating um, black history into American history and not making it something special we do just in February. So the Amistad Act is uh, covering that and we're still integrating that and this is covering uh, genocide education. Um, and just so everyone knows, it is not just uh, talking about one particular genocide in the past, but it's also this uh, entire um, list also included modern day genocide and things that are happen happening presently. So hopefully that does spark some uh, social activism and some real social justice muscles are built in the eighth grade. So um, I think that's about it. We uh, covered everything and that is my report. It's social justice muscle building. That's what, that's what the eighth graders are in for. I like it. Andy Land could have <laughs> <laughs> talked about that. Yeah, it's all right, uh, does anybody have any questions for Michelle on uh, her report today or any of the agenda items? Nope. Okay. okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Mr. Krieger, Finance and Facilities. Yeah, so I'm going to go up and give a short uh, report on um, demographics. Excellent. You're going to do that first, eh? Yeah. Well, it's your first order of business? Sure. All right. Okay, so um, just to give some background. Um, Make sure you have a mic. Oh, sorry, here's my wireless mic. Thank you. Make sure you have a mic, Mark. Okay, can you hear me? Thanks for catching that, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so about uh, three years ago, we started talking in the Finance Committee about a uh, demographic study, just to see how many students we might expect in our school district over the next 10 years. Um, and that's from the perspective of too few students, you can't run your programs, 
and too many students, you don't have space for them. And uh, we had been uh, at uh, different numbers over the years. Um, and um, so we, we authorized a, a demographics uh, study. Uh, we got the study, uh, received the study, and a presentation from the demographer in February 2017. Uh, the, the study showed um, a large increases of students, um, which concerned us all. And when he presented to the board and then the, the finance committee read the report, it was a very comprehensive report, it was a great concern to us. Um, we don't get more state aid, or we hardly get any more state aid. We have our 2% cap on what we can raise taxes. Uh, we don't have unlimited classrooms. Uh, this becomes a concern for us. So um, about eight, 18 months later, um, we had more data. Between a year and 18 months later, we had more data. And uh, so I revisited that and wrote an, kind of an addendum to that report and presented it to the board. Um, here are numbers from, from the demographer's report uh, supplemented by numbers that we have, that we've gotten in 2018, 2019. And so you can see uh, in 2012 and 2013 and 14, the numbers increased. Um, but from that point on, the numbers have been very consistent uh, for the past uh, four years, uh, 2016, 17, 18, 19. Uh, the numbers averaged about uh, 1,625, 1,630, but it's been relatively consistent. And then one would ask, in going forward, why would these enrollments increase or decrease? Um, one cause of increase would be new housing development. Uh, we've had new housing developments. I'm going to talk about that in a second um, and how that's affected the enrollment. Um, increased or decreased birth rate could affect the enrollments. And then a uh, change of population characteristics could, could change the en en enrollments, although the third one I'm not going to cover because we have no control of that, and we also have really no information about that. Whereas housing development we know, increased, decreased birth rates, at least for the foreseeable future we have some numbers. So the housing developments. The demographer identified five developments that were complete or being built. Uh, the, the crossings, the Overlook, uh, Merriwald, Highland Cliffs, and the Heritage. The, um, the numbers uh, from the demographer indicate that we could expect 40 to 60 students per 100 new units built. That depends on, is it one bedroom, two bedroom, or three bedroom? Who is it identified for? Is this for young professionals without children? Uh, is it for retirees? Who are we looking for? Who are we looking at? Um, but at this moment, we have some numbers. And a year ago, even, we had the numbers. The crossings and the overlook, those are the Pulte projects down on River Road, they are sending substantial number of students to our schools. We're getting about 80 students, and there are about 200 units. The Heritage, which is a large project that's on Cleveland, is just now being cleared. That was slated for two years ago. That just hasn't happened. Uh, there was remediation on the site. Um, and we might expect 50 students from there. I mean, it could be more, could be slightly less. Um, you'll see next the Merriwald, which is up. It is built. It's further down on, on uh, River Road. We have, I think, last we checked, nine students coming from there. And we know that because we're busing them. That's, that's a property where there are, in fact, uh, buses to the train station in New Brunswick. There's young professionals. Uh, there are retirees moving in. Uh, there are very, very few three-bedroom apartments. They're mostly one- and two-bedroom apartments. Uh, that's a demographic that'll get you very, very few students. Um, the other property is the Highland Cliffs property. Um, that only has 23 units. And those are, those are large, proper, uh, large property, but for 23 units, we might get 10 students. I, uh, I think the number is not uh, likely to be large. Uh, again, it's close to the train station. You could walk. So that gives you a certain kind of demographic you might get. And then the two new properties on just about the only land left in Highland Park are Buckwoods and Walter Avenue. Uh, Buckwoods, they're talking about 75 units. Walter Avenue is talking about 45 units. So again, we might see 
40, 50, 60 new students from those properties. Uh, those are a ways off, um, but we're not going to see, as the demographer suggested, we're not going to see 2,000 students uh, in a year or two from now. That's simply not going to happen. And those were the kind of numbers that we saw in the report. Um, the other factor we could consider is birth rate. So the report had birth rate numbers from Middlesex County. Um, and you notice the birth rates have actually gone down slightly. Uh, the number in 2012, which would be a cohort we might see in 2015 or 16 or 17, uh, was 134. But in 2016, the number was 99. Uh, 2018, extrapolating out from numbers we got from the demographer as likely, um, the numbers are also lower than the 2012-13 numbers. So that's decreasing slightly. Oh, that's right. When I take that and I put that all together, the additional housing accounts for the increase in school population over the past 10 years of about 90 students. Um, on the first slide, we were at about 1,530 students in uh, 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 ten year, nine or 10 years ago, and now we're about uh, 1,620 students. That, almost all of that comes from the new uh, Pulte houses. Um, new housing might increase school population up to another 8%, um, but is not likely to be significantly more. Um, the current slightly lower birth rate might decrease school population but again not likely more than five percent so the estimate that I'm giving based on all of these numbers is a school population in a range between 16 to 1700 students in the near future next three four five years uh, which may be very optimistic um, because that's a very good range for us it means we don't have so, when I was on the school board 30 years ago, we were down to 1,400 students, and we were worried. Uh, you get down below a certain number, you can't have a program. And if you have 2,000 students, the question in the demographer's report was, where do you put them? Where are the spare classrooms? These numbers are good numbers, and I don't see with the limited land in Highland Park and the uh, demography of the population and the birth rates not changing much, if anything, going down slightly, that we are going to see numbers very different than that. And I think that's the report. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. That was great. Yeah. And then any, any questions? Well, I think the other really important part to mention is that in the Finance and Facilities Committee, we're looking at this on a monthly basis. So every month we're looking at what our numbers are that month, and we're comparing it to that month the year before. So we're constantly accumulating data that's constantly running so we're looking at this really really closely on a monthly basis so if we were to start to see a shift that is different than what we're projecting we're going to know it pretty quickly it's not like we're not going to look at this for a couple of years and then be like oh my gosh where'd all these kids come from we're constantly evaluating this because it is a concern if we have to if we get to a point where we don't have space we need to figure out where that space is going to come from. And that's kind of been this like fear factor for as long as I've been on the board of what's going to happen if we run out of space. Um, so it's something that we've made sure that we're looking at continually, especially in light of all of the construction that's been going on, because you see all this development happening and it just automatically sets off, you know, warning bells. Um, so I think it's really important to assure the, uh, assure the community as you're driving around town and you see all this construction that it is something that we're keeping a very close eye on, constantly monitoring, monitoring the space that we do have in the buildings, how many more students could we accommodate. And you know, 50 students might sound like a lot, but when you spread 50 students out over four buildings, it becomes a lot less. Four buildings with you know, four to five classes in each grade, you know, it's, it's manageable. Um, I, I did want to thank uh, uh, David uh, Copperman's in the audience, and uh, he had sent an email out to some board members asking about what's it, what is it looking like, and you really prompted me to go back to the numbers and get something together. So thank you. And um, former we, board member David Copperman, a uh, former yes. board member, and we 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 have been doing this uh, every every year. Um, I was thinking of doing it later rather than earlier, but it prompted me to do it, and I think, I think going back and looking at the numbers was very helpful. 
So thank you. All right. So does anybody else have any um, questions or comments for Mark on that specifically? No. Okay. okay. So, so um, hit it with the rest of your report. Okay. So I'll be sending out uh, minutes for our finance committee report. Um, two things I did want to bring up before going through the um, before going through our uh, uh, formal agenda. Um, one piece of uh, not so good news and one piece of uh, good news. You know we're under financial pressure. We can't raise tax as much by law, um, and we have obligations that we have not so much control over. And uh, so um, moving forward into this year, from last year, we will have to take money from surplus. That's not a crisis. It's not a lot. But we will have to take about uh, 200,000. Well, we're not sure at the moment, but we may have to take as much as 200,000 from surplus. We will have surplus left. It's not as much as we want. Um, but uh, we, we, in effect, didn't save enough from last year to move it forward into this year to move this year's, uh, make this year's budget uh, whole without taking that money. The good news is a preliminary report on out-of-district placements of, of um, special education students um, has uh, decreased. One of the reasons for that is that we have had uh, we ha are putting a uh, program in, into the school and bringing four students back into the district, which both means those students don't have to travel out of district somewhere else to get their, their education, which is wonderful. Uh, it saves us on the uh, exorbitant costs of some of the outside uh, placements. It saves us in transporting those, those students. <clears throat> so that's all very, very positive, and we will save money with doing that with Rutgers. Uh, that program, uh, but also we've had, uh, we seem to always have students moving in because we have an excellent program. Um, this summer, some students moved out of district, so uh, we will be saving some money on that and probably enough to counteract some of the money we need to take out of surplus. Um, we also, um, Dar Darcy mentioned these uh, students, every month uh, from, uh, at least when I started on the board, um, more than three years ago. Uh, in our finance committee, uh, Linda provides us um, an excellent report on where are we in the budget versus what we allocated for the budget. So we can see every month, what have we spent that we didn't mean to spend, and what money did we get or save that we didn't expect to get or save. And that's extremely helpful to know where we are so that we don't wake up one day and say, oh, we're a million dollars short. That will not happen. And so, um, it, you know, when we look at that, uh, uh, we will be able to see within a few months some of those savings that I hope we can continue in the uh, special ed, especially bringing the program back in house. Um, for, uh, looks like four students are going to come in, uh, come back in who are uh, uh, district students. Um, but we'll see other things, other savings, and other expenses we didn't expect. Um, so that's the report from the committee. I'll have a more detailed report going out to the, to the board in minutes. Um, as far as the uh, agenda, uh, we have our bill lists and treasurer reports and secretary's reports and certifications, which are items numbers 1 through 13. Those are our usual reports, um, which get us up through, I think, didn't go through, yes, get us through June 30th. We have um, the item 14, which is a an approval of a legal, a legal settlement, uh, which is the recommendation of superintendent to approve a legal settlement agreement with employee number 4726. Um, number 15 is approval for contractors for professional services. Um, the first two of those are professional development presenters, Eric Lepis and Laura uh, Rigolosi. Uh, the majority of the rest of the items are um, contractors for the Educational Services Program. And the next to last, Evocate, is a contractor who monitors um, Italian which is our food services provider, and the actual payments will be made and reimbursed to the district by that, by the food service provider, yeah, Italian. So that won't, won't 
I apologize for yes. interrupting. It's the, um, not the food service, it's our custodial services. Oh, I'm sorry, the custodian, You're, I'm sorry, the custodian services. Uh, <laughs> going too fast. Okay, number 16 and 17 is the um, approval um, of the in-district handicap transportation renewal for $85,181. And 17 is approval for summer transportation for extended school year uh, 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 transportation for $4,228.30. Number 18 is an increase of 10 cents per meal for the school lunch prices. That's approximately a, uh, an inch, oh, and, and 15 percent a cents. And that's uh, three to five percent increases, and that's uh, pretty typical. Uh, item 19 and 20 are uh, quotes for a purchase of a dishwasher um, and for Bartle School Kitchen. This is an industrial quality, serious dishwasher like used in cafeterias and restaurants. I actually looked it up online. Mm -hmm. I said, how can we be spending 30,000? Well, this is a serious large piece of equipment. Um, this equipment lists prices for $40,000, so we are getting discounts, and it includes, um, it includes the equipment uh, being uh, installed and the old equipment being uh, taken away. Um, number 21 and 22 are quotes for replacement bleachers, which will cost us $9,266.95. Item 23 is our panic buttons for, for all of the schools, costing us $12,880. Uh, number 24 and 25 are non-public school transportation costs. So that's uh, reimbursement costs uh, from the state of New Jersey uh, for the amount of $82,330. Um, and that money is uh, being uh, uh, put back into uh, the unreserved uh, fund balance for uh, special education transportation. Item 26 is approval or acceptance of extraordinary special education aid that we receive uh, for the amount of $287,221. Item 27 is a list of 31 students who are gonna be going out of district. Uh, that's in contrast to last year, 1.41 students. So many fewer students are going out of district, and that leads to the sense that we will have some saving. We are going to add more. We went over this earlier uh, via email internally. We're going to be adding more, but there still will be some savings associated with that. Um, item 28 is a settlement agreement, uh, and 29 for two special needs students. Um, and then item 30 um, is a, oh, it's the contract for Rutgers to um, work with us for that special education classroom um, and at Bartle. And then 31 is acceptance of a Walmart grant for $2,000 for the robotics club. Um, and this was apparently applied for by the uh, person who mentors the robotics club, if I'm not mistaken. I think we, we had heard that. So that's the whole list. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mark on any of the finance facilities items? Yeah. Um, the nursing services substitutes for the middle school. Do we expect that to just be a month or do we expect it to be longer? I think that's on the middle school the, nurse. Um, How are we doing? Scott, I, it's, it's a personnel matter, but I can explain it to you now. So uh, we are still looking for a middle school nurse. Fortunately, the person who we hired from Bayada, which is a service that provides nurses, um, we, the same person we used at Bartle when Ms. Toy left, is willing and able to come to the middle school for however long we need her. She was wonderful, very well received at Bartle. So we're in good shape temporarily, but we're still on the hunt. 
Um, the bleachers. Yes. How did we come to the realization that they needed to be replaced, and is that like an absolute necessity right now? Linda, the middle school bleachers? Yes. This was um, discussed during budget time. Both of the middle school bleachers are original bleachers from when the middle school gym was was uh, built in oh the God. late 90s. Um, the new bleacher, when we had the addition uh, in uh, 2006, seven, we had new bleachers put on this side of the room. They're not being replaced. It's the original bleachers and they're in really bad shape. So we are doing them over a two year period because we're trying to spread out the cost. There's two sets of bleachers. So we budgeted for one set of bleachers this year and we're going to budget for the other one next year. Okay, great, okay. thank you. I just wanted to comment on number 20. I think the Board of Health will love mm -hmm. number 20. And they can probably second all of the positive things that you said oh, about yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. the dishwasher, so. Right. Thumbs up. Right. And, and just a quick note on 28, the extraordinary special education aid, um, of, which is less than what we had budgeted for for next year. We, had, we thought that we would receive about $300,000, which is yes. what we budgeted. So the state, in its infinite wisdom, is continuing to underfund our special education program. So I'd like to give a special shout out to the state for that one. Sorry, Darcy, um, did they and, give us a heads up that they were going to be giving us less? No, and this is the real no. frustration. Thanks for setting that, that ball up, Michelle. I'll spike that right back down. High five. <laughs> Um, this is actually with the state saying that there was an additional five million dollars put towards yeah. extraordinary aid this year for the state, but some of that somehow none of that managed to trickle into Highland Park. Um, Phil Murphy said, so, um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, when we do our budget presentation, bu budget presentation this coming year. Um, Last year, Scott did his budget presentation as we've kind of been doing for a number number of years, and then afterwards, I did a separate presentation on that really highlighted the underfunding that the district is suffering from at the hands of the state. And this coming year, I'm going to propose that we merge those into one presentation for the community next year. That at the same time that we're looking at our district's budget, we're looking at it in the context of the underfunding that we're receiving from the state. Because when I put that presentation together last year, even to me, it was striking to see how year after year after year after year, we receive less funds in just about every category. And in categories where we spend a lot of money, you know, this is money that we put out to service students that need extraordinary services, and the state is supposed to be giving us back a certain percentage of this, and we must be down to them giving us at about half of what it is that we're owed. So this just continues to push those costs down to the local taxpayers and it, it, it's a pinch from every direction. So um, I hope in our next budget presentation, or not well, I, in our next budget, budget presentation, we will put all that together and I hope it's illuminating for the community to see the continued constraints that are, that are put on us um, by this lack of, uh, lack of funding, so. Just wanted to highlight that little nugget. Um, Quick question. Yeah. Um, yeah, all of that was a lot uh, <laughs> to just be reminded of. Um, the surplus amount is how much now, then, Mark? The surplus. The surplus now is uh, five hundred thousand. It's going to go down. Um, oh, it's going down. It's going to go down to no. It'll go down to three hundred thousand, depending on the auditors. Um, we are not in a position, I believe in the future next year or two to take from surplus again. Right. We are going to have to find ways to make it work, even though the state isn't funding us. Um, and you talk about the state funding of the special education at a certain level and then not giving us that or not even giving us half of that. That level, the initial level, is half of what the initial levels right. were 25 years ago. So the numbers are completely insane. Um, if you run a good program so people want to be here to get the good services, you are penalized yeah. because the state doesn't help you and they help you less and less and less. And the money has to be coming from somewhere and we have to find ways to do it. And, and in fact, the bringing of a classroom in, which takes two students who are in the district and four students out of district and has a six student special education class 
will, will probably save us, I'm picking a number, $150,000. Uh, everything has to work perfectly. Um, if we're able to get another student from another district who needs a similar uh, special education classroom, we might even earn some money on that. We have to look for ways like that to do things because there is no more give. You know, I maybe I say that and Darcy says that, uh, you know, from the finance committee and her, her seat every year, but it's just getting gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and more and more and more and more and more difficult. Um, um, and, and that's, by the way, not to mention the increase in uh, the medical insurance, which is through the roof, you know, 10 and 11 and 12% increases every year on an item now that takes um, about a sixth of our budget. Medical insurance is costing us a sixth of our budget. It's not, it's not uh, sustainable, um, and that's also all under the control of the state because we have the state health benefits plan, state health education benefits plan. Um, it, is not, it is not sustainable. So we really need to be thinking of creative things to do, um, and, and pounding on the state to make changes. You almost think we need a task force <laughs> on these issues. I, I know you're, you're kind of a, you're a bullhorn on that, yeah, for, but, but seriously, like, yeah. you as, need to. As much as it's rewarding to be on this Board of Education, the most frustrating thing is the lack of control over something which should be as simple as this, you know, making the numbers add up and work and it's extraordinarily frustrating and, and, and makes no sense at all. And uh, it is, for the state uh, government, it's like a political football yeah. where no one takes, no one takes credit right. for and, making those changes and, other and than this, talking about it. Yeah. And this trickles up to the fact that the Fed, federal government still has not fully funded right. IDEA. Right. <laughs> so we have to, it's, it's a huge problem. Yeah. And this one was a particular, particular thorn in my side because as we went through the budget pro process, you know, and Scott will tell you I'm not the biggest optimist in the world. I tend to like scan for what all the problems are going to be and, you know, very often I find them and I'm correct, unfortunately. Um, I was saying the state's going to put more money into extraordinary aid. Come on, we can put a little bit of extra money in the budget. Linda's like, nope. And I, come on, we, nope. And Linda won. The one time I got suckered into being a little optimistic, not little optimistic, not only was I wrong, but they underfunded us even less. I'm like, well, there you go. That's, we'll do that again. that's what we'll I, exactly. Optimism. No, there's exactly. a few things we won't do again because of, of not trying to be optimistic and we're gonna have to, um, y you know, there was a, an uproar over, over um, re uh, removing a program, eliminating a program uh, at budget time. There was an uproar over a discussion of uh, uh, re uh, reduction in force in, uh, in uh, some areas. Um, but that's the only place we can look now, and that's ridiculous. It's terrible. Nobody and I want to say, to rightly that. so. I mean, there should be an uproar. We shouldn't, we, nobody wants us to be lo losing programs or, but I mean, uh, the point in bringing all this up is it, it's not going to get any easier next year. So. Buckle up, everybody. It's I just wanted to mention yeah. that I just happened to read an article that was just recently taken down because it was a little too honest. Um, it was in Forbes magazine online, written by John Merrow, and oh. you know him from PBS. I do know John Merrow. I've yes. Met, do you know what? Here, I'm going to give you a little local trivia. John Merrow is the first cousin of Muffin Lord of That's Highland Park. Right. Okay. <laughs> How cool is that? So... Muffin Lord's first cousin, as we will now refer to him, <laughs> John Merrow, wrote an article for Forbes magazine, several, but one of them that was really interesting it was the title, uh, Let's Follow the Education Dollars. And it's very interesting to read, although Forbes thought it was not so interesting because they took it down. But um, anyway, it does talk about how these things are uh, nationally prioritized and how it puts a lot of pressure on state governments to, um, you know, put a, a private, private profits ahead of public mm -mm. benefits. Um, and it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. It's kind of, uh, it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> this is happening. And John Merrow does speak about this. So if you want to 
learn more and maybe it's important for us to keep John Merrow in our conversations when we do these presentations because he does do a lot of the math and background information on how these things you know, happen and, and why the budgets are as tight as they are, even though we are the richest country in the history of the world. So he's a pretty good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah, I just I thought it was crazy that I just happened to read that article today. All right. Well, I'm going to look for that one. All Enjoy. right. As much as we could wax prophetic about this all night, all we do right. have the rest of our agenda to get through. So um, if no one else has any other questions for Mark, we're going to move on to personnel uh, with Chris. Chris, you're on. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we, uh, we had a pretty b busy summer. Uh, we met last week and uh, discussed a number of issues, and also we saw a lot of each other from many of the uh, hiring committees. You guys Dr. really did have a busy Taylor summer. Taylor has involved us as well as other community members and uh, teachers in over the summer. If it wasn't, weren't so unprofessional, I would suggest we would meet at the beach next summer. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, we had a... Um, a number of, of uh, resignations, including uh, items um, uh, six, uh, seven, and eight. Uh, Kristen Nicoliccia, special education teacher. Uh, Rebecca Fittipaldi, supervisor of curriculum and instruction of humanities. And uh, uh, Mr. Hanks, our, our, our media specialist. Uh, I understand the, uh, the search for seven we discussed is going fairly well, I think. You said we have a number of good candidates uh, for that. Uh, for for uh, number number seven. For number seven. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The supervisor number number, number eight. Eight to struggle. Yeah, it, we're we're struggling, and uh, the committee discussed that uh, this is a Im very important position for the district. And uh, but I have to yeah give ahead. Judy Petrobono a shout out. Mm -hmm. She and I emailed each other uh, over the last couple of days, and so mm -hmm. thanks to her help, we were. We've found three additional outlets that we haven't used in the past. So we're going with four professional association list serves. We're hoping we'll find great. somebody within the next couple of weeks. Great. Okay, that's also, that's I, great to hear. I don't know if you uh, were there, but there was a presentation at the last workshop in Atlantic City about um, media specialists and how they're underutilized in their positions with their expertise. So mm. I'm going to find that information and forward that to the personnel committee, if that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on the good side, we were able to make our number of hires. We're very excited, as you already uh, said, to hire on uh, Nicole Krubsky. That's number 11. Um, we also discussed, uh, they uh, lost uh, two uh, African American administrators recently in the district, and uh, our recruiting efforts in attracting underrepresented minorities for the district haven't been going that well, and we discussed a number of avenues for improving that, and hopefully we'll have something to report about that uh, maybe at the next meeting. Uh, moving on to, uh, we had a number of uh, uh, maternity uh, replacements uh, approved. Uh, let's see what else. We have a new uh, English teacher. That's uh, number 24. I don't know if I can pronounce his name correctly. Uh, Damien Love Fauci. Fauci. Okay. Uh, uh, I won't. I won't comment on uh, the uh, intermediate numbers, like number uh, 27, moving all the way through. Uh, Number 51, uh, and uh, uh, number 52, uh, we had some discussion, uh, not during the meeting, but afterwards. Uh, this, this is something that came out of the negotiations committee uh, with Mr. Uh, Krieger. Um, this is our uh, honors option for the um, history and, and English course, and uh, in which we're trying to improve, among other things, track mobility in our history program. And it does require some additional uh, prep time by the teachers who are teaching it. But uh, we discussed that um, this is not going to actually affect the number of students that they're teaching, and so mm -hmm. it's really not a major budget concern. Um, if anybody wants more clarification about that, I guess they can ask uh, Mr. Krieg or Dr. Taylor. Um, I think that about uh, wraps it up. Did I forget anything? Yeah. Uh, number 20, 29 is, is crossed out because the 
person has uh, turned down our offer. Is that right? Yeah, I received an email this morning that uh, Emily has to withdraw her candidacy. She's one of the replacement teachers we were going to hire. That's a bummer. Yeah. We have someone else. Uh, it just happened this morning, so no. No, that's it. No, no, no. But uh, do we have other prospects? Uh, right. I'm working. I'll, I'll, I don't know that yet. Okay. Uh, we may have to go back out and post. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm also going to move. There's a typo on the uh, after 49. It goes to item one by accident oh, instead dear. of item 50. So uh, move to renumber uh, one is 50, and then the following items sequ sequentially. Okay. The right motion. Okay. All right. We will do that when we. Uh, yeah. We move those items. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Um, anybody have any questions on personnel? For I, I kind of had a little bit of a, a suggestion, I guess, for a number 34. I don't know if it's a suggestion, but since they already met, I don't know if this is um, unnecessary, but there is a, an SEL curriculum um, that might be helpful to that group. I don't know if they're in need. But I could forward that. Uh, all the merrier. Right now, they're they're at they're working now, so right. that would be helpful. Okay, I'll get that to you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have anything on personnel? No. Thank you, Chris. All right. Um, policies, Mr. Krieger. Yes. Yeah, so we met uh, last week. We um, we're trying to go through the policies to. Uh, fill-in policies that are mandatory, uh, which uh, are either missing or quite out of date. Um, and these uh, five policies, um, this was uh, myself, um, Anne, and Michelle, these five policies all needed to be updated or are new. Um, and they're straightforward. Um, we did update uh, 8550 which is the unpaid uh, meal charges, just to reflect that the student would not be harassed or hassled over unpaid bills, but rather the parents would be. So we wanted to clarify it. Well, you know, if someone runs up a $500 bill right. and you say, you're not graduating high school, that's not right. What's right is you tell the parents you run up a $500 bill and we'll see you in small claims court that's or right. something. And so that we made changes to the policy while we were Good. discussing the food services policy, which we didn't have, which was 8,500. Um, the others are all straightforward. Um, and then second reading is the student use of privately owned technology, which needed to be changed when we went to the one-to-one -one computer loan program. And the um, uh, regulation on attendance uh, was reviewed um, as a, um, as an addendum, really, on the on the policy on attendance, after consultation with the uh, with the uh, administration and staff, and so that's that's in for second reading. So we we talked about that last month, and okay. and twenty three sixty three. Okay, great. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mark on policy? Mm -hmm. No, Chris. No. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Monique. Equity and excellence. We have not met since our last meeting, and I think we're planning on uh, getting something on the calendar in September. Okay. Monique, uh, I don't mind sharing publicly that I uh, finally scheduled a meeting with the local police department about the MOA agreement. Oh, you did? And it'll be ahead of, I think, what our next meeting is scheduled for, oh, or perfect. likely what our next meeting is for. Perfect. Okay, great. All right, so that brings us um, to public comment. Uh, Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation. It's reserved this time for your comments. Please make your way over to the podium, and um, there should be a sign-up sheet there that you can put your name on and state your name and address for the record for the board secretary. Tara Canavera, 361 Crowles Road, Highland Park. Hi, Tara. Hi. <laughs> um, First, I'd like to say I'm very impressed with our students and all that we've heard from them t this evening. Very impressive. Um, and impressed with you doing that obstacle course. <laughs> the only reason you're the only superintendent is because you're the only one fit enough to do it. <laughs> um, so I'm here tonight to talk about CPAC. Um, as many of you know, it wasn't active last year. 
I was extremely busy and the only thing I had time to do was to go to IEP parents meetings with parents to help them get services for their children. However, Susie and Dee Dee and myself have been working really hard this summer to get information out because I have been the only board member for the last few years. So we have a lot of people who are interested. Oh, good. Um, Dr. Norma Bowe has agreed to let us have a meeting at her house for all the interested candidates. We're just working on a date. So I just wanted to let all the parents know that, is it okay for me to give my email? Sure. Anybody sure who's email. interested <laughs> in being a part of CPAC, you can email me at C-A-N-V-E-R-T at Kane, K-E-A-N dot E-D-U. And we're planning on having the meeting in the next few weeks, and I'll be giving you more update on that, and a letter will be going out. We've also decided you don't have to have a child in special ed to be a part of the board, because special ed affects all children. So it's open to anybody who's interested. We even have a few professionals who don't have any children in the school system anymore, but live in the community who have shown interest. So we will be being more active this year and we already have our calendar semi-set and I'll present that to you in September. Great, thanks, thanks so much, Tara. That's really exciting to hear. Thank you. Thank you for all the time put in on that. Should be there. You want a thumbprint too? <laughs> Just a little retinal scan as you look down. Don't worry, David. DNA <laughs> uh, Oh, this is interesting, effective age here. Uh, David Copperman, uh, Hill Street, 120 Hill Street. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, yeah, former school board member, and I want to express my appreciation to the work that Mark did and all contributed to. Um, it's something that we did not do back when, and it's kind of an obvious thing staring in the face. So I, I greatly appreciate that you've, that you've taken on these numbers. The question I have is uh, if you've been in touch with the uh, borough on this at all. Uh, and I ask because just from observing during the Democratic primary, there seemed to be a huge emphasis on expanding the tax base for residential development. Uh, you've, as you've said, you know, the amount of available space that's left is, is limited, but that doesn't preclude tear down and replace. And I just wonder if the borough is properly aware of the constraints uh, that the district's facing in the event of uh, any spikes in student base. Um, you know, there's always kind of a firewall between the school board and the borough, and I wonder if in a case like this, a little bit of uh, discussion, just even your presentation you gave tonight, doing that at a, at a council meeting, you know, would probably be uh, worthwhile. Right. So I can let you know that um, Dr. Taylor and I, um, well, let's just say we schedule more meetings than actually happen, but we do schedule meetings regularly from time to time. They do get um, canceled with the mayor and um, Councilwoman Welkovitz, who is the, the council's liaison to the schools. Um, so um, Susie and I are in very close contact um, throughout the year on multiple issues, but this is, this is one of the primary issues um, that we're in contact on. The board has toyed with off and on, you'll see later in our agenda that we have lots of liaisons to different yeah. borough committees and things throughout the community, including CPAC. Um, I've toyed with the idea of some way to get us, and even asked about like, could we have somebody on the planning board or on, like somewhere in that process so that we have a little bit more of an, a, a, an advanced alert system. Um, haven't quite figured that piece out yet, but, um, I mean, I think we've had a couple of hiccups here or there in the last year, but for the most part, I think that communication works pretty well. Um, and, you know, we, get, we do get alerted to new construction. I mean, the one issue that was a little trickier this past year was the use of pilots and that that has started. Um, we've had our first, the Walter Avenue um, development will be the first time that a pilot has been awarded which is a payment in lieu of taxes so that was a little bit of a sticking point and we had a little bit of discussion mm -hmm. around that um 
the thing that I've learned all these years being on the finance committee where uh, these guys have heard me say this before, my big joke used to be if you want to punish me, put me on the finance committee because <laughs> I'm like, I, but now I actually am like learning to understand a lot of this stuff and it's, I've found it really helpful. And the thing that I've learned, which was always a big hope, of, hope that I had was, oh great, if we have more, if there are more people in town and there's more housing, we get more money. No, you don't. You know, it's just, gets divided up, we all pay less when the tax incre increases happen. So, um, you know, more development isn't gonna increase our, allow us to increase our budget, but it's gonna make the hurt a little bit less on each of us individually mm -hmm. um, as, the, as our budgets do just increase the 2% that they, they can go up. Um, so, I mean, but to your question, uh, we haven't heard anything about any kind of tear down and replace or anything in those regards. The only thing that we know of that is still potentially, well, the Walter Avenue is definitely coming online. That's been torn down and that's, I don't know what the timeline is on that, but that is moving forward. And Buckwoods seems to be in some weird stalled limbo. So other than that, we don't know of anything else that's going yeah. on. I guess the one thing out of all that that sounds good, Darcy, is that it sounds a little reactive. Uh, just. I, as I said, I mean, I, I think Mark is right. I can't imagine that there's suddenly going to be this grand new development that could cause some spike in the district, but you just want to kind of stay out in front of it because the, the borough's going to have their own motivations for what they do. So, um, uh, Also then, uh, I'm, I was glad I was here. I, I want to ask Dr. Taylor, uh, you made a reference to a $40 insurance charge for computers. Did I understand that right? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? So, well, uh, so when we hand out the Chromebooks, families can opt in if they choose for protection insurance, for accident protection insurance, because they will be responsible otherwise for damage that's done to the Chromebooks we give okay. them. Okay, it's been a while. So when you say hand them out, this is for mandatory usage? No, uh, going back to when there was that massive Family. purchase of Chromebooks some years ago? May I? We, we call it now the one-to-one -one program kind of blithely, but I, I think not everyone in town knows what's about to happen. We realized we could lease equipment on a, in a three or four year lease um, and, and actually provide those to students at the high school and middle school in lieu of buying piecemeal, but buying machines piecemeal, and putting them on carts in classrooms. Because so many students didn't have computers. And so homework gets assigned, and some kids get on the computer at home, and some kids have no computer at home. So over the last year, we've been discussing this. We've been discussing a program to lease computers. Uh, they're Chromebooks. They're not super expensive. They're $280 each or something like that. Uh, leased over three or four, I think they're four-year lease, um, and these, these students will be able to take them home, um, and then the families can purchase insurance uh, for $40 unless they get free or reduced school lunch, which is about 40% of the population, in which case the, the cost of the insurance will either be zero or, or very, very strongly discounted. Okay, I, I can see I'm very out of date here. When you're talking about uh, kids don't have computers, so you're talking about for personal use at home, or is this mandatory for classroom use, that where they're bringing it home for homework and that kind of thing? Yeah, for bringing it home for homework. For what we were finding is that even though students didn't have access at home, teachers were assigning homework that required students to have computer access. <sighs> And we kept we're, we kept trying to solve for that problem yeah. with buses, with uh, after school time, with all kinds of things that weren't successful. So what we were creating essentially, and what the board has been discussing, is a digital divide, where we had students who do have access at home, do have Wi-Fi at home, who could complete the homework, who could do the additional assignments that were being assigned, and students who couldn't, who had no opportunity to do them. So and our survey. And it determined that there was a significant number of kids who didn't have. Yeah. They were using mobile devices, which aren't sufficient to do right. you know, for productivity. But for purposes of, uh, of classroom, what, what grade are we talking about where this is introduced? Just middle school and high school. Middle school and high school. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I think, for what it's worth, uh, I wish they weren't in the middle school. Uh, the NIH has done plenty of studies on the 
the deleterious effect on cognitive development of point and click and the, the addictive quality of computers. And I worked in computers for 36 years, so I have seen a fair bit well, of this. Let's I'm just glad say, you're uh, not doing it in the um, elementary schools. John is back there who's been doing a lot of this. And I think John would probably agree and said, he's made them pretty not fun. <laughs> like, they're really not going to be able to do much on these other than their work. They're not going to be able to access, you know, Instagram. social media or anything on these devices. These but devices even, are going to be locked down even when they're at home. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but even for the use uh, for homework. I, I, I don't know enough to be able to make broad statements like that. But Dude, you, trust me, you're not going to find many people who are more skeptical, skeptical than a bunch of the people who are okay. behind this table. This was presented to us, what, I think three years ago for finance in budget, and Mark and I and Rob Magaziner, we were just kind of like, <laughs> that's funny. We were completely like, we're, skeptical about it. I mean, it's taken a number of years and it's taken the opportunity to do it in a way where we actually saved money as opposed to laying out hundreds of thousands of dollars for something that we just didn't have the money for and really getting the assurance from the administrator, administration and the supervisors that this is just going to be another tool. And again, it really grew out of the fact that this became an equity issue. This became, I mean, that was the main driving force was we were getting to the point we were so frustrated, you know, because a lot of us are parents in the district too, so we see the things that are assigned and we see that our kids who have computers and Wi-Fi and whatever can come home and do their homework, but we know that there some of their classmates can't. Okay. So we were getting, the policy committee was getting to the point where they wanted to write a policy that says you cannot assign any homework that, and realizing that that's not going to work. So we have to figure out a way to make it so Good. that our teachers can teach the way they, they need to teach in the current, you know, almost, you know, 2020, but we can bring all students along on that journey. So this seemed like the, the best meeting in the middle place. Okay. I appreciate all this uh, background. I'm learning as we go. I, I am very out of date. Let me ask one other then, if you, don't, if you don't mind. There was a massive purchase of Chromebooks from initiated by, if you will, a prior regime some years ago. And now you're referring to leasing. What happened to all those wonderful PCs that there was a huge spike in property taxes for that? Uh, there, there, were, um, there were purchases of Chromebooks a lot of that had to do with testing. You know, needing, needing equipment as the park tests were, you know, needed to use those. Right. Um, many, of, <clears throat> many of them are around the district. Many of them are broken. Many of them are out of date. And we realized, and three years ago, there was a discussion, we'll buy more and give them to the students instead, which was just a no-go for a lot of reasons. It hasn't worked elsewhere in some cases. It, no, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the, the, those machines, what's left of them, <laughs> will go down to the lower grades. Okay. So the lower grades will have proper classroom equipment that the teachers can use on carts. But there aren't, and, and, and the teacher computers, you know, teacher classrooms, the teacher should have a, a computer in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Many or most of the teachers don't have proper PCs. That's part of this lease program, which okay. again, as Darcy said, saves the district money mm -hmm. and also saves the district money on, on curriculum, on books, on textbook purchase, much of which now can be done on, with online textbook purchases for much, much, much less money than the hard physical textbooks cost. So. It's not going to be perfect. You know, it's not going to, everything's not going to work the first day. But we waited long enough, I think, compared yeah. to a lot of districts, that we have a very good shot at this being really good. good models out there. I mean, some districts yeah. bought machines from kindergarten through 12th grade, including, including high-end high -end, um, MacBooks for the, for the high school, and uh, didn't have great success. Mm -hmm. Hoboken mm -hmm. had machines in closets after a while. They were the leader in this, um, which is what I said three years ago and Darcy said. I think we have a very good shot at this being a, a very good, a very successful program. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks David. David. Thanks for coming. Okay, uh, if there isn't any other public comment. 
All right. <laughs> um, we're going to move on to a, our board action items. Uh, Michelle, could you move the curriculum and instruction items for us, please? Sure. I believe there's only three, but let Did me you just scroll go? back really sure. fast. For what? I, I did, uh, forgive me. What? No, I'm good. You're good? Okay. Okay, so I oh. would like to move items one through three. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? No? Uh, seeing none, Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden T. Nicola? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mark, could you please move the finance and facilities items? Yeah, I'd like to move items 1 through 31. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No. Seeing none, Linda, could we have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden T. Nicola? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Okay, and Chris, could you please move the personnel and communications items? Uh, you'd like to move items one through 54 after renumbering, is that right? Yes. Okay, and there was one that we had a table, right? Not table, just strike. Oh, just strike. Uh, strike number right. 29. Okay, wonderful. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? No. Seeing none, Linda, can we have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden D. Nicola? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Okay, and Mark, the policies and regulations, could you yeah, move I'd those, like please? Yeah, I'd like to move items one and two. Okay, any discussion? Oh, sorry, a second? Second. Uh, any discussion on those items? No. All right, seeing none, Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden, Dean Nicola? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Alrighty. Um, so that brings us to our board liaison uh, reports. So I guess, Scott, you'll appoint someone new for um, next year. For Correct. Municipal. Darcy, point of order, please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Under equity and excellence, is there an item to be moved? Oh. It's so not it's typical. So it's not it's typical. So That's so why holy, I mentioned holy. it. Holy, I'm so sorry. Well, sorry. Mark, you're doing my job for me. Thank you. I'm going backwards. Monique, move your equity and excellence oh item. Um, yes, I move item 14. Right, hold on. It, it needs to be item one. We need to renumber that. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's 14, yeah. It should be. So, but that's why we one. probably one. skipped it. Yes, yeah. That's, 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 skipped. that's really one. Okay, one, and that is our thank you, Mark. Our the equity plan. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure. I'll second just. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay, Linda, can we have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden D. Nicola? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. All right. So, um, Scott, we'll, you'll appoint someone new. Mr. Wasserman is working on that. Wonderful. Uh, Mark, anything from. No, nothing. Although nothing we. On any of the three of mine. And there's a new. There's a new Boston town. There's a new person in charge it? of HPTV. So maybe. Don't tell them. I don't know who that is. Uh, but I do. Uh, it's Gary. George High George Highball. Um, so maybe we need to make a connection there. So we'll figure that out. Okay. And I'm glad you put that on my radar because I thought okay. to reach out to who was it again? Uh, I'll I'll get his contact information and send it to you. Okay. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, I think Gary sent it out before um, he was done, so. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Rob is not here to update us on HPEF. Um, Chris, have you gotten connected yet with the Universal Access folks? Uh, no, we, we uh, Terry was just, we were just talking about the scheduling. And nice, I All think right. the new scheduling will make it possible for me to attend the meetings, thank you. Fantastic. Um, and has Rebecca been to any uh, public library meetings recently? No, in fact, I've been in contact with the board, and they suggest I wait until September. Okay. There's a meeting coming up next week, but. Okay. Um, still all quiet on the shared services front. Um, 
we just got an update from uh, Tara on CPAC, so we look forward to hearing from Ruth about that this year. Um, Monique, you have any postdoc updates for us? No meeting of postdoc uh, the whole summer, and I think there's some uh, changes in uh, delegation of responsibilities, so hopefully okay. in September we'll get an update. Okay, cool. Um, Anne's not here to update us on human relations. I hope Anne is somewhere having a wonderful time on vacation with her family right now. Well deserved. Uh, Michelle, anything from the Board of Health? Uh, no meetings, but I did receive an email that the Board of Health is interested in um, making uh, condoms available to students through the school. Um, what I did was kind of a mistake, and I went ahead and I <laughs> go, we just forwarded it to Ms. Azamoa in the Teen Center, as well as uh, Ms. Mazur, the um, high school nurse. But what I should have done was forward that to Scott. And so. Um, lesson learned. Lesson learned. But I think that we are making progress in that department. There are um, condoms purchased by the Board of Health, packaged, ready to be offered to students um, with discretion and privacy, you know, priority cool. number one. So um, everyone seems pretty enthusiastic about that. And I don't have any answers as far as where they can be found or anything because that hasn't been decided yet but once that is decided I'll let everyone know okay thanks uh, let's see Rob Roslovich is not here to update us on um, green team or Middlesex County School Boards although I know he did attend a Middlesex County School Boards Association meeting last I think it was last month sometime um, they had kind of their their yearly um, reorganization meeting and elected new officers so there were new officers elected and um, actually somebody from the New Jersey School Boards Association emailed me and said, could you guys please send someone? We don't have enough people, and if we don't have enough people, we don't have a quorum. If we don't have a quorum, we can't vote. So yes. Rob was nice enough to um, offer himself up and got himself to the meeting so that he could be there to represent um, our board and vote in that election, so that's great. Um, we appreciate Rob making that effort. Um, and uh, as far as the delegates in the Jersey School Boards, um, there's another meeting. Their next meeting is in May, and I think the next um, deadline to submit um, resolutions. Me. May? I'm sorry, no. The last one was in May. The next one is in November. Sorry. Um, and um, I think the ne deadline to submit resolutions is in September. So I'll, uh, if anybody has any ideas, let me know. But. Um, I don't have anything brewing brewing at this point. Um, all right, so that's it for our liaison reports. And then for my president's report, I just wanted to remind everybody we have our board goals that need to be set um, for the upcoming school year. So um, Scott and I have already been discussing that. Scott um, was good enough to take a look at our goals from last year, cross-check them with the um, cross-check them with our strategic plan and where we are with that so he's put that all together we'll make sure that you guys all have that um now could you just share that with the board now scott yeah. um and we'll look to do this at our meetings in september and get this done um by the end of september but i want to want you guys to have a nice chunk of time between now and then to take a look at it think about it um and come back with any ideas so you can see scott um did a nice little color coding for us so we know um, what Scott is suggesting um, our board goals from last year that have already been implemented, ones that are in progress, and ones that he's suggesting that we add in for the 2019-2020 school year. So take a look at that um, at your leisure over the next uh, couple of weeks until we meet again, and we'll start that discussion at our first meeting in September, and then we'll finalize that discussion at our second meeting in September. Um, Oh, we do. Oh, we only, only have one. Oh, meeting. that's right. We only have one. All right. So we're doing it all in one shot, people. September 16th. Oh, okay. Oh, Raiden, you won't be here. So I'm sure you will I'll give us some you. input. You I'll will give us some you. input before you go. I I'll forgot that September was only one meeting. Oh. That's September we don't, 16th. We don't usually do that in September. I forgot. Uh, if I may just remind the board and for Chris's edification that uh, point out that the board goals have been aligned to the strategic plan goals. In some cases, they were expanded upon, but there's alignment there. So that's why, for instance, the new goals uh, I'm proposing um, are 
you'll note, are lifted right off of the strategic plan. So you have a right. starting point to continue that alignment. Right. And all of this is important as well because this is how the board then evaluates Dr. Taylor um, at the end of the year. So it's important that all those things are tied in and it also kind of, it does bring up the conversation of when we engage in strategic planning again, which is coming up relatively soon. Um, so we're gonna have to start talking about that throughout the year. And I think it would actually be next summer, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, you know, we're getting to the end of that five-year cycle. And so it would be time to bring the community together again, um, which is, you know, it's an amazing process. I think it'll be really cool to bring people together again and say, hey, here's all the work that we did five years ago. Here's the progress that we've made on that. Um, what do you guys think? How are we doing? What do you want to add? Um, so um, I'm really kind of looking forward to that. And it's been this, it's been so, I've been on the board, I've been on the board pre-strategic plan and I've been on the board post-strategic plan and this is far preferable because every year literally doing the board goals was like throwing a dart at a dart board. And it, there was, yeah, I mean, there really was, there was no structure to it. Um, and it's kind of hard to plan for the future when you don't have a framework around which to plan. So um, that strategic planning session that we did was really important to bring everybody together, not only to set those goals, but then also so Dr. Taylor has a direction so that we have a direction and you know we ha constantly have something to refer back to that we're not just you know pulling ideas out of thin air and on a whim, you know, but this is actually what happened when we brought our teachers and our administrators and our community and board members and everybody into a room and we all put our heads together and this is where, this is the direction we decided to go. And you to gotta go. know, this has been filtered down to the teacher level. Their professional right. development plans are aligned to the plan, to strategic plan. The principal's PDPs are aligned to the strategic plan. Even our professional learning community work, it's all right. coming back to this. And then obviously again, our budget. You know, our budget priorities are then based on what makes the strategic plan work, so. So yeah, so um, so I look forward to doing that, I'm sorry, in one meeting in September um, and getting feedback from Mr. Mr. Krieger ahead of time. All right, um, so does anybody have anything for old business? I, I just wanted to ask uh, Linda if uh, we uh, have gotten any notifications about the school boards convention in the end of October to signing up for the district to sign up members to go. Yes, we, uh, I thought we notified you all back in May or June. The uh, registration opened up then. Did, uh, let me ask my administrative assistant, because I thought that she had gotten a list of I names of people. I did not get one. No, okay. I don't think. And okay. Michelle was also asking who was going, right? Yeah, I, didn't, I don't think I received it either. Okay. Yeah. If you could get us a mail, I'll, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just so we know before I yep. go off on my vacation to right. get you the dates. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Look forward to it, especially with negotiations coming up. Okay, um, and anybody else have anything? Old business, new business? I think this no. might be old business. Um, well, I wasn't, uh, I'm not giving a, a presentation or anything, but today we had our uh, TGNC policy committee, you know, review. Oh. We get together again and. Um, do you oh. want to give the acronym out for anybody yeah, who's watching who sure. does not? Sure, TGNC is Transgender Nonconforming, mm -hmm. uh, and that is around the policy writing and review for uh, the transgender students and faculty that we might have in our district. So um, when, we, when we got together today, we all talked about um, the idea of this being kind of a new concept for a lot of people you know, through no one's fault, but trying to understand the concept um, as a community came up, um, as a school community. Um, and I know that even though it is a small population in our community, it is uh, very, um, very much here and has always been here. So I ran across um, a resource that I wanted to share with everyone, and it really is a very basic type resource, but it's for educators and for anyone interested in understanding um, what we mean when we talk about transgender, when we talk about transgender rights, and why this is important to integrate into our, our district. Um, and a lot of people have a lot of questions and, you know, uh, might be uncomfortable asking those questions, might be afraid to offend. So I thought I would share this resource with everyone. And it is um, 
a curriculum resource, but it's not a curriculum per se. Uh, it's just, you know, a resource to start the conversation and to uh, not have to do too much uh, running around the internet if you want to learn more. Um, but there is um, a collection of different things, reading materials and such. Um, it's yesmagazine.org. And uh, if you search in their search bar, it's uh, let's talk about transgender rights. And there's such a great list, uh, discussion questions and curriculum, and uh, it's all about supporting kids that need the support and also showing the rest of the community that isn't a part of the trans community, um, you know, that we are sensitive to everyone's needs and that we take care of one another. So I think it's really beneficial for everyone. Um, but the discussion did come up today that it is um, something that children, very young children, can't advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of um, confusing messages that we send kids without meaning to. Um, so I think this is really useful for especially like early childhood um, educators and people that have young children. So Irving Bartle parents especially. Cool. Yep. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else have anything? Any business? Mm. No? Okay. Uh, public comment. Any more public comment? No? Everybody's good? Okay. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>